Thank you, Gregor. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Joanna Mendes. I'm a senior scientist at the UK Met Office, and I've got the pleasure to co-host today's workshop alongside Gregor and Sukanta. Um, so we'll be guiding you throughout this event to bring you the very latest updates on deep learning um, weather-based power prediction. Um, but first, just to briefly give you uh, some kind of context of how we got here, um, I guess we need to trace our steps back all the way to the 1950s when we saw the official birth of artificial intelligence. And then, as we know, we've seen that over the years, AI has grown, it has matured, it has transformed industries, and it has shaped our lives. Um, and particularly in the last 20 odd years, uh, we've seen a big surge in the research and the use of AI technologies um, that have popularized deep learning and big data. And actually, the first AI-based application in um, renewable energy um, dates back to 1996. Um, as most of you know, a paper by uh, a, uh, George Karinyotak is at all. Um, and so we've seen major developments in wind and solar power forecasting that have been greatly pushed by multidisciplinary projects mm -hmm. like the Animos and Smart Res. Um, but more recently, um, we've also seen very fast-paced AI advances and data-driven innovations that are emerging in the meteorological sciences. Um, so this has brought really exciting advances in weather prediction. Um, and we all know that meteorological forecasts are vital to our society. They help us mitigate uh, risks associated with natural environment. Um, they can inform a variety of decisions and contribute to the growth of uh, industrial sectors like energy. So. In this workshop, we wanted to bring together both communities, so the energy meteorology and artificial intelligence. Um, so we'll be giving you a, an overview of the current landscape. And we we'll, wanted to look at some of the questions. For example, what is the current state of the art? Um, what are the implications to power predictions and more generally to the energy sector? Are we going to see a new paradigm in data production and the service provision? and what are the opportunities and the challenges that stakeholders can expect. So joining us today, we have um, an awesome array of experts presenting on the topics of deep learning and weather prediction. So we'll start with our keynote speaker, Marianne Claire uh, from the European Center from Medium Range Weather Forecast, ECMWF. And after that, we'll take a short break and then we'll return to hear more from uh, Gregor Hakim from the University of Washington, Joel Orkanson from Linkoping University, and Florian Ackerman from ETH Zurich. And finally, we'll open the floor for discussions. So in the meantime, we'd like to encourage all of you to, um, to ask questions and to participate in the Ulam Forum. So we'll be using uh, the platform Slido, so we'll share the, the details in the chat briefly. Um, and I guess the last thing to say is that we're aiming to wrap up around half past six at Central European time. So stick around if you can. If not, there's always an opportunity to uh, to watch the the workshop as it's being recorded. Um, okay, so without further ado, I think I'll now pass on uh, to Mariana, who will present on the rise of data-driven weather forecasting. Hi everyone, thanks for the introduction, Joanna. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Hopefully this works. Um, so now you should be able to see it if I now in presentation mode, correct? Excellent. Thanks yeah, very much. Good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my name is Mariana Claire and I work at ECMWF. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about yeah the rise of data-driven weather forecasting. So this is work, um, I'm going to be talking about it in a general sense about what's going on in the community, but also specifically what we're doing here at ECMWF. And I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank my colleagues, many of whose names are listed on the screen, but there are, it's a very big project at ECMWF, so there's lots of other people um, who are involved. So I mentioned ECMWF, but I wasn't sure if everybody in the audience would know who we were. So we're the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. And we're, a, we're an international uh, organization um, formed of about 35 member states, of which you can see on the screen and, and the flags are at the bottom as well. Um, and so uh, the idea is that we want to try and address uh, difficult and critical research problems 
um, the, in, in the field of weather forecasting that would be too difficult for one country on its own to develop. Uh, so it's sort of the, the EU message of a uh, strength of a common goal kind of thing. And so we're, we're, we're in the field of weather forecasting. Um, and so traditionally, we've always used uh, NWP or numerical weather prediction. So that's where you have computer code uh, representing physical processes governing how the atmosphere evolves. But as, as we all know by now, uh, this, is, this is evolving. And can we produce a forecast without a numerical weather model? So at the moment, the schematic that people are using is, is something like this. So you start with the analysis, which is produced by a numerical model. Um, and it's a, a fusion, basically, of short range forecasts uh, with observations. And it's sort of our best guess of the current state of the, of the atmosphere or of the, of the Earth system. And so you either then apply a numerical weather prediction model to produce a forecast, or you can try and use a data-driven model, learning from these. Uh, so in general, they tend to learn from about 40 years of analysis and they, try, and they predict um, a data-driven forecast instead of a numerical weather predicted forecast. And so it's a very fast and evolving landscape. So Joanna gave a bit of an introduction there at the beginning as well. Um, so we, we, there was a, a, the first sort of big data-driven weather forecasting paper was uh, by Peter Dubin and Peter Bauer in 2019. And, but really, they were looking at one variable, at one atmospheric level um, at 500 kilometer resolution. So really a very, very coarse model. Um, and since then, things have evolved very quickly. So uh, we have our, our machine learning roadmap at the beginning of 2021, but really things started taking off in 2022. So you have uh, Ryan Keisler's paper uh, using a graph neural network, which was competitive with the with the GFS with the with the US model, uh, and then you have um, Nvidia uh, who come up with a forecast net, uh, which is now which is is and an, and then was as well at quarter of a degree. So we're starting to talk about proper resolution. So quarter of a degree is about thirty kilometers. Um, and we keep going. Uh, so you have Pangu weather in November 2022, Graphcast, so obviously the you know big change uh, at the end of December of 2022, and it just kept going. Last year, I mean, you can read there's was so many models that came out. Um, we have the Feng Wu, we have Fuxi, we have Nvidia, Nvidia's new um, new version of their model. We have Atma Rep, um, and now at right at the end of last year on Christmas Day, we also then had the new Google model as well, GenCast. So this is a sort of the big picture overview. And uh, through this talk, I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, in depth about some of these models, um, the ones that we, we think are particularly interesting. Slides. Yeah, we go. Um, so in general, these models in the training, how they work is they're trained on the on the reanalysis data sets, specifically on era five, which is produced at ECMWF. And in general, they they well, they all step forwards in time and generally they take a, a six hour time step from analysis to analysis. So they auto regressively step through um, the forecast. And so era five is what's being currently used and era six will be coming out in 2026 at higher resolutions um, and hopefully also more physically accurate. And so that will definitely see, uh, I imagine that that sort of timeline of the very fast evolving landscape will get another push in 2026 with, with era six, but there's certainly advancements that can be made well before era six comes out. So, that was a very sort of high level uh, look at, at what's been happening in the landscape. And so I want to focus now at some specific models. So the first one that I that we think is interesting um, is called is ForecastNet um, by NVIDIA. And I also have put on these on these slides, I've highlighted where um, I think what's really nice about the AI community is a lot of these models are fully open source or open source for non-commercial use, which is really great um, if you want to try and understand what, what's going on. Um, and so NVIDIA's forecast net is fully open source, and they use these um, uh, AFNO, so these Fourier neural operator architectures. Um, but basically what you want to think about is you have these sort of patches that get transformed uh, through the, into a Fourier space using just Fourier transforms like we would use it in, in the numerical model, actually. In our numerical model at ECMWF, we also use uh, Fourier transforms. Uh, and then... 
it goes through the, the sort of the network and then it gets decoded into a space that we can all sort of interpret and understand. Um, and this paper, this paper was uh, quite exciting when it came out, partly because of what I just said, that they transformed it into Fourier space, which is exactly where our numerical model um, operates. And so this was quite interesting to us that it was sort of taking this idea into the AI space. But ForecastNet had a problem. So because they were operating on a sphere, which are those of us who work in, in global weather forecasting know can sometimes be a little bit complicated, um, they had this problem where they had the breakdown in the poles. And so in um, late uh, the end of last year, um, they came out with a new version of the model called the spherical, uh, with a spherical Fourier neural operator. And this video very nicely highlights that they no longer have this sort of breakdown at the poles. And this is the version that we are currently running at ECMWF um, to conduct experiments for evaluation. Then uh, shortly after ForecastNet, you have the appearance of Pangu Weather by Huawei. And again, it's open for non-commercial use. And, and again, it has this sort of transformer approach. Um, so it takes the patches, it encodes them, transforms them, decodes them, and, and you, then you get out your, your forecast. Um, and this one, is, so again, we, we ran it at ECMWF for experiments and evaluation. And actually, this was the first model that we were able to uh, fully access. And so we did a lot of analysis and verification of this model. And this is really where we gained a lot of understanding about how these data-driven models um, can work. And then I guess the one that, that changed a lot of things for a lot of places, um, which was Graphcast uh, by DeepMind. Um, and so Graphcast doesn't have a transformer approach. It's a, instead, it's a, um, a graph neural network with this multi-mesh message passing idea. And what do I mean by that? Well, you take the, the data, the raw data, and you encode it onto graphs um, using this encoder part. And then you have this multi-mesh. And so this allows you to learn information at different scales, at the coarser, the very coarse M0 mesh and all the way down to the very finer M6 meshes. Um, and then uh, and this allows you to sort of pass information between these scales. And then at the end, you get uh, the decoded out information. And just like the, the other forecasts, um, so what they do is they predict six hours ahead and then they roll it out um, so that in the end, they end up with a 10-day forecast uh, in total. And what really made graph what really made people sit up with Graphcast was um, this scorecard which appeared in their uh, in their preprint version on archive. Um, so this is a scorecard that we're very familiar with at ECMWF. Um, what we do we when we make a change to the model we look at it and we say okay where have where has this change improved the model and where has this change uh, made the model worse and Graphcast did the same thing but their comparison was Graphcast versus uh, the uh, our sort of operational ECMWF uh, numerical model. And where it's blue, that means that in this score, if full root means squared error, Graphcast is better. And where it's red, the ECMWF model is better. And what you can see is basically it's all blue. So the exception is uh, the red parts are in the upper atmosphere. Um, but really, I mean, it's a very, very blue. And this is what really made people um, sit up and say, okay, right, this this is, there's something here that, that we can, that it deserves exploring. So as I just said, that there's an undeniable skill with these data-driven models. So this metric is the anomaly correlation. But for just the important thing to know here is that when the uh, value, the higher the value, the better. And so this is a plot of Pangu weather model versus the ECMWF high resolution model. And what you can see is that for all the forecast times for these variables in these regions, uh, the Pangu weather model is better uh, than the ECMWF HRES model. But it's one thing to look at scores. One of the things that we look at in, in the weather community is we like to look at specific events and see how these mod how models fare for specific events, which we know it may be difficult to forecast. Um, and so this is uh, Storm Eunice, um, which hit the UK in February of 2022. And so on the top left, you have um, the analysis. So that's the best our best estimate of what actually happened. Uh, and then in the middle, you have the HRES, which is the ECMWF's operational model, numerical model. And then you have the three AI models that I've been talking about. So ForecastNet, Pangu, and Graphcast. And what's really key to notice is that they, they get the intensity. The intensity is definitely of the same order of magnitude. Um, and the, the features are in the right, roughly the right 
space, uh, or the right place, sorry. Um, but yeah, you can see a little bit, I would argue, I mean, it's difficult because the images do look very similar and that's maybe a positive thing, but you could argue maybe that GraphCast has got a little bit more of the variability uh, in there. It's not quite as smooth a forecast, maybe forecast net looks a bit smooth in this case, but really when you look at these, you can see that the, these models are doing a, a fairly good job at predicting this storm. Now, the other big claim, and this was particularly a claim that, that Pangu Weather made, was that they were doing, they could predict tropical cyclones better than the numerical models. Um, and so this is tropical cyclone Freddy, uh, which uh, appeared in February of 2023. And so again, we have the analysis, which is the best guess of the truth, the HRES numerical model, and then we have Pangu and, and ForecastNet. So what you can see is that ForecastNet gets the, the location of the tropical cyclone really wrong. Um, so that, and it's also talking to colleagues who, you know, who are experts on tropical cyclones, the shape is also wrong. Um, but Pangu, the, the, the location is right and the shape doesn't look too bad. But what I wanted to highlight here is the intensity. So it should be that sort of dark black intensity and it's not. Um, and so this is something that that Pangu and other uh, some of the other AI models also suffer with, which is that they get the track in the right place, but they get the location, sorry, of the, of the cyclone in the right place, but the intensity is not quite there. And one of the reasons is these models, uh, all of the AI models are a fine, uh, at coarser resolution, so they're all at 30 kilometers roughly, whereas the um, operational numerical model the HRES is at nine kilometers, and that definitely helps with intensity. But that's why we've also included the ERA 5 forecast. So that's also at 30 kilometers. And you can see that it, it has got, it's not got as good an intensity as the, the operational model, but it still is doing much better than Pangu. So that's definitely something that we need to look at when they, when these claims are made, when you say, okay, tropical cyclones are better in AI models. The tracks maybe, but the intensity, it, it's not quite there yet. And so, so this was a little bit of analysis, uh, looking at the model, uh, looking at these AI models, but I wanted to encourage um, you to have a look at this paper, which we uh, submitted in July of last year and, and should be published soon, um, where we really dug into Pangu, the Pangu weather model, because that was the first one that we got access to and uh, really evaluated it just as if it was a new numerical weather model that had come into come into existence um, and looked at all the different things that we'd look at, looked at extreme events, looked at biases, looked at different seasons, um, all these sorts of things. Uh, and I think it's a, well, I'm obviously biased, but I'm, I, I think it's quite interesting to see how Pangu fares versus um, numerical models. But obviously, I mean, we can talk about skill and accuracy and, and these things are important. The skill and accuracy does need to be in the same, in at least as good as numerical models to be as for these models to be accepted. Um, but one of the things about these, one of the big advantages of these AI data driven models is the gain in time and energy. So admittedly, constructing era five, so that's the reanalysis data set on which they're all trained, takes about 15 billion units, let's say, but it's, it's a one off. If we only did it once and era five was not built for AI models. It was built uh, for the weather and climate community. So it's not really fair to say that's a cost that's just for machine learning. Um, but that's so that's but we have to take that into account, obviously, but it's a one off cost and it's done now. Uh, the to produce the forecast, our operational forecast takes about 180,000 units. So in in a sort of normal people speak, that's three, about three hours it takes on our computers. But to produce AI weather forecasts is uh, are about all of these models run in about 0.3 units in about which is about one minute, and you could run them on your laptop, no problem at all. You could probably run them on your phone, um, and so this is a huge, huge gain uh, in time, uh, and also comp you know this is a, a a workshop with a focus on power and energy, but there's also you know the amount of energy that you have to spend to produce these forecasts. It's just is, is nothing compared to the amount of energy, like raw electricity energy, I mean, that goes into the to the HRES forecasts. And I'd, when I'd like to encourage you as well. So we've tried to make these models um, really easy for researchers to use. So we have these plugins. So if you just have Python and you do a pip install AI models Pangu weather, you can run your own forecast of Pangu. And as I say, it doesn't take many resources. You can do it on your own laptop. 
Uh, you do need a GPU uh, to do the predictions, but most a lot of laptops have them now, or you can get one on something like Google Colab. Um, so we have one for Pangu weather. We have one for the old version of ForecastNet. We have one for Graphcast, and we have one uh, for the new version of ForecastNet. And hopefully, we're hoping that this can help the, the sort of weather community make the forecast, have a look at them, play around, see what's happening. Um, and yeah, really start to explore them for themselves. So that's what everybody else has been doing, really. Um, and what I want to talk about now is, is what we've been doing at ACMWF. Um, and so uh, a lot due to Graphcast, we, you know, when we saw the results from Graphcast, I think um, at ECMWF, we thought, okay, we need to think about building our own data-driven model, and that is um, AIFS. So AIFS was unveiled in uh, mid-October of last year, Friday the 13th, which uh, was ironic, maybe, um, but it all went well. Um, and um, here you have the sort of first plot that we showed, which is anomaly correlation. So again, um, the anomaly correlation, that's the same variable that I showed with the smiley face and the sad face. So again, the higher the value, the better. And the red line is the numerical model, our numerical model. And you can see that, um, so ForecastNet and um, Pangu are slightly worse than our numerical model, but both AIFS and Graphcast are significantly better in this metric um, for, for this uh, versus the numerical model. And uh, crucially for us, I guess, AFS and Graphcast are at the same sort of level of accuracy for the, for this variable. So this is a, one of the, this is geopotential and sort of mid-atmosphere. Um, and I should say, so actually yesterday we unveiled the second version of the model. So this version that you see here and all the results I'm going to show you today is at one degree resolution. So that's about 110 kilometers. Um, but now our model is at the same resolution as Graphcast and ForecastNet and all the rest of them. So that's the 0.25 degree, 30 kilometer model. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, it was released yesterday, so I didn't have time to, to update the plots. Um, but everything I'm going to say basically still holds. So I, and I like to play a game a little bit um, and we can see um, see if you can, can guess which model is which. So on here we have... Um, AI, one of these pictures is AIFS, one of these pictures is the numerical high resolution forecast, and one of the pictures is Pangu, and one of the pictures is um, a Graphcast. Uh, and so I'll give you a clue, um, which is that the, as I said, the HRES is at nine kilometer resolution, the AIFS version here is at 100 kilometer resolution, and the other two are at 30. So that might help you um, to work out which one's which, and, and I'll give you the results at the end. So how is it, what is AIFS? How have we set it up? Um, so AIFS is using a graph neural network. Um, and so we're encoding, so a bit like Graphcast, so we, we encode it onto these graphs and we have these multi-meshes uh, with simultaneous multi-message passing happen, happening on the processor. And then again, we decode it back onto sort of a, a more legible uh, grid. And we chose uh, to use um, this message passing approach for the graph neural network. Although now we've also, in the new version, we've actually uh, started implementing this attentional uh, version as well, um, which is is giving us uh, slightly better results. Um, and so we can look at the scores and we can look at the results and compare them with the, with the other models. Uh, so here we have the top plot is uh, the root mean squared error uh, of the forecast for T850, so that's the temperature in Z500, so the geopotential. Um, and you can see that, uh, sort of again, Graphcast and AIFS are sort of uh, sort of in the same ballpark. So better than the numerical model and better than than Pangu weather. Graphcast is slightly better um, for Z five hundred in some in the longer lead times, but it is sort of marginal uh, and partly due to resolution. And then the other metrics that, that we show here is to try it. So one of the criticisms people have of um, AI models is that they are very they can produce smooth forecasts because they're targeting root mean squared error. And so we looked at this metric, which is called forecast activity. And you can see, so the pink line is the mean of our ensemble. And all you need to, I mean, I imagine quite a lot of people on this call will know what, what an ensemble is. But if you don't, it's just a forecast. Uh, the mean of the ensemble will be very smooth. We know it by construction, most of the mean is a smooth forecast. Um, and so that's sort of like a baseline smooth forecast. And you can see that 
all of these AI models, none of them are as smooth as the ensemble mean. They're all in the same sort of sort of in the same order of magnitude as the numerical forecast, maybe slightly below, um, but not very much. And then the other thing we looked at is, is, is the bias. So this is sort of like the mean error. Um, and you can see that there is this sort of trend in Pangu um, uh, sort of where it becomes colder. And the reason why we, we highlight this here is because when we first saw this in Pangu, this cold bias trend, we were a bit worried. Um, and, and someone, one of my colleagues said, um, <clears throat> if we kept on running Pangu out to, to, for longer forecast times, we'd get to the ice age in about two years. Um, and so this is a worry that we had that maybe this was something inherent in, in data-driven models that couldn't be fixed. But actually, if you look at GraphCast and AIFS, actually the, there's a, for this, in this variable, in this, in, in this um, term, term period that we're looking at, the bias is actually better. So you want the bias to be zero and the bias is actually better for, for the temperature than in the IFS. Um, so it doesn't seem to be an inherent problem, although AIFS in this version had a bit of a problem in, in geopotential in the bias. So overall, these, these metrics look good. Oh, sometimes it doesn't want to go to the next one. Um, and we also, but this is verifying against, um, sorry, I should have said, this is verifying against analysis. So that's our, our best estimate of the truth. Um, but we can also verify against observations. So that's sort of uh, that obviously problems with observations but but it's another thing that we need to check against um and here we have i took the opportunity to show the effect of resolution as well so the red line is the numerical model uh the dark brown line is the one degree version of aifs uh the orange line is the 160 which i think is the half a degree and then the uh, orange dashed line is the 0.25 degrees and so you can really see that, especially at the surface, when you're comparing its observations, the resolution of your model has a big impact. And it's very nice that you can see that as you increase the resolution of AIFS, um, it improves and to the point where at a quarter of a degree, you're doing better than the numerical model for root mean squared error. And we can also look at the, the biases. And again, we see that, okay, maybe there is a bit of a bias um, in the that's there, but I mean, it, it's not too dissimilar in terms of magnitude to the biases that you see in the IFS. And Storm Eunice, so this was a storm that I showed you before. So just to show you what Storm Eunice looks like in AIFS. So again, it's got the intensity, right? Uh, the structures are, are looking good as well. However, it is a bit, there are like small scale structures that AIFS has missed. Um, but a lot of that is to do with the model on the left is a nine kilometer resolution and the model on the right is a 100 kilometer resolution. So it's not going to be able to capture all of the smooth, smaller features um, that IFS can. So, but it's certainly looking like it's going. And actually, yeah, there's a little bit of intensity here, uh, maybe off the off the south coast of the UK, which AIFS hasn't quite captured. Jason Sky, really good. Um, so there are uh, some, but there are still, there is obviously I've been quite positive so far, but there are lots of key challenges facing machine learning models uh, in this realm. So I've been talking a lot about analysis, obviously, um, but if we really wanted a purely data-driven, pu real pure data-driven approach, then we want to train on observations. Um, because so far, all we're doing is emulating the forecasting part, which takes about 50% of the, of the time from sort of going from observations to having the forecast. And so, yes, we can speed it up, but we can only speed up 50% of it. So really we want to try and train on, on observations directly. And then really that could be very groundbreaking. The other um, uh, challenge, and it's something that, that I've been working on a lot is how do we add uncertainty? So weather forecasting is, is very uncertain. It's a chaotic system. There's lots of uncertainties in the model, uncertainties in the observations and the initial conditions. And so we really need to understand this uncertainty, um, particularly if there's some extreme event, we need to know whether this extreme event is going to happen or not. Um, Oh, sorry, that was, we need to know if there's a probability that this extreme event will happen. Even if it's a very small probability, uh, we, we need to know. And so this is something, but the problem is in the current models that I've shown you so far in the current state, um, they're all deterministic. So they don't, um, they just give you one scenario and you need a range of scenarios. And then the final thing, maybe a uh, final main challenge is really building trust in machine learning models, because there's definitely a worry that they're not learning the physics. And so 
and particularly then might not be able to forecast unseen extreme events or things extreme events that are becoming more and more extreme with climate change they might they might struggle with so learning from observations so just to illustrate a bit the challenge the problem is there's scattered and noisy data um, and it's sparse um, and th there's not there's not a homogeneous data source um, so this is one of the reasons we picked a graph neural network because it can can cope with an unstructured mesh and this might help us if we're trying to to sort of import observations in, into our model or introduce um, observations into our model. So, I mean, I think this picture very nicely illustrates what a mess it can be and the, the sparsity of the observations. You've got no observations in, for this particular data set. There's not many observations in, in the oceans and things like that. So it can be a difficult problem. So for uncertainty, so we're sort of aim, trying to head towards um, ensemble. So an ensemble is where you have sort of a, a range of possible scenarios um, that that might occur, and each of them, each of these scenarios should have an equally likely probability of occurring. Um, so that's the idea behind an ensemble. Um, and so what we could use, so we already have in our model at the moment, in the numerical model, we have to capture the uncertainty in the initial conditions and the uncertainty in the model. Well, given that we initialize in the AI models on the same conditions that we initialize the um, numerical model, we could just use the ensemble initial conditions on AIFS. And that's what we've done here. And what this is, this plot is um, basically the variance versus the error. But the key thing to note here is that you want those two lines, the dashed line and the, and the solid line, um, to be equal to each other. And so you see with the IFS, which is the, our numerical model, the black line, they are sort of uh, equal to each other. And even just having initial condition uncertainty and, and using that in the AI model, AIFS, sure, the, the, the variance, the spread is still lower than the error, but it's it's gone quite a... You, you are managing to capture quite a bit of the uncertainty just by using these initial conditions, uncertainty. But then, I mean, we want to try to do more than that. Obviously, we want to get those two orange lines on top of each other. And so we can try and uh, train to minimize towards scores, um, things like CRPS and things like that. Or we can try, and or, I should say, it's not really or, all of these methods can be applied together. And um, we can try and use generative models um, so that's when you try and uh, train on real samples and then generate new samples from noise. Um, so these things can be like things like generative adversarial networks or diffusion models. And that's exactly what we saw at Christmas from, from Google, from DeepMind, sorry, um, which is the new GenCast paper. Uh, and so GenCast is using this diffusion model approach where you start from these this noise and then you uh, slowly denoise it until you get to a true state. And what that means is that you can sample, you can sample as much as you like from that, that noisy state, that uh, the Z to T zero state, um, and you can generate as many scenarios as you like. Um, they are still using ensemble initial conditions um, or rather numerical initial conditions. So they're a little bit limited uh, by that. So they can't just have an ensemble as, quite as big as they want, but from the perspective of model uncertainty, they could have an, a, as big an ensemble as they liked. And the plots I've included here is is the spread skill. So it's that that same plot uh, from the previous slide. So here you want the you want it to be one. You want the error and the variance to be roughly equal to each other. And you can see that um, so the black line is our ECMWF's ensemble, and the blue line is GenCast. And you can see that yeah, Gen uh, GenCast is the ratio is very close to one. Um, there are there are still caveats. We'd so the paper only showed plots like this, which is was a sort of global average of these metrics. It would be nice to see some spatial plots, but it definitely looks very promising. And then the, fi the final challenge that I mentioned was building trust. And so now at ECMWF, we routinely run uh, data-driven forecasts, initialized from our own initial conditions. Um, and, and the idea is for forecasters and, and uh, users to look at them and say, okay, yeah, that looks realistic. I can, I, that looks like a what I would expect or maybe there's things that are a bit wrong and things that don't look quite right um, and so yeah so we have up the uh, uh, AIFS forecast net Pangu graphcast and also uh, Fushi which which isn't uh, on this page and so to finish I don't know how many people got it right um, these are this was the challenge that I set uh, near the beginning at uh, the beginning of this uh, section 
Um, so the top left was Pangu, the top right was Graphcast, and then IFS, so the numerical model, was the bottom left, and AIFS was the bottom right. And so this was the hint that I, I was trying to give. So the, the nine kilometer definitely captures some of the small features. So I think that one is fairly easy to identify. And then ARFS, because it's so much coarser resolution in this version, um, is also sort of the, a little bit uh, less detailed in the features. And then, uh, yeah, the tricky thing I think is to identify between Pangu and Graphcast. Um, so yeah, I'd be interested to know how many people got that, uh, managed to spot it, but it's hard, it's very hard. Um, and so with that, I, I'd like to finish and conclude and um, just say that definitely these data-driven approaches are showing great promise and even showing that they can do a reasonable job for extreme events. And definitely there are still challenges to overcome, uh, but the landscape is fast evolving as we saw from this GenCast paper that came out at Christmas. Um, you know, it's already in every couple of weeks, it, it can really, you can get these groundbreaking changes. Um, so yeah, th with that, thank you very much for listening and, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Mariana. That's been a really, really good overview. If you've gone into um, some in-depth, it was really fun to to have that that game as well. <laughs> I think I got them all right. Um, right. So we do have a lot of questions in the chat. Um, what I thought might be an idea to maybe group them together um, into kind of topics um, and then we'll see how far we get with the time we've got left. Um, so we've got a couple of questions on the uh, sort of computational expense. Um, so the question is AI, where the codes are incredibly cheap to run, what are the computational expense of training them? Um, and there is another one, um, mm -hmm, if I can find it. Yeah, so I suppose you could start with that one and then we'll we'll move on to, th to the next topic. Yeah, uh, yeah, so definitely there is a training cost associated with them. Um, so our current uh, model takes about, I think it's just over a week to train, maybe a little bit more. Um, so yeah, that, that is a cost, um, but you can, just like with a numerical model, um, when you're developing it, when you're fine tuning parameters, things like this, you can get away with doing things at, let's say, a coarser resolution. So that's the reason why I'm not 100% sure is because in the development stage, which is where I'm working, we have a, a simpler, coarser version of the model, which only takes one or two days to train. And that allows us to really explore the parameter space and, and change things and tune things. And um, so, yeah, they, they do take time to train. And, and obviously, um, there is a cost associated with that. It's so it's true that it's not just the one minute to make the prediction. Um, but once they're trained, um, they're really, I mean, yeah, then they're really fast. Yeah, thank you. So uh, there are quite a few questions around um, the use of ERA-5, i.e. reanalysis. For example, how would you justify the use of ERA-5 as input for training these models rather than the analysis? In practice, only the analysis is available. There's also another question around, um, I, I think you've actually alluded to this um, already, uh, was uh, the storm units in the, um, included in the training data of ERA-5? Um, and um, is the expected resolution of uh, reanalysis to be to, uh, to of your six or the next generation reanalysis will uh, will it employ um, AI in its production? I don't know if you're able to answer any of these. Um, yeah, I'm quite interested to know. Yeah, yeah. So um, I don't that this discussion came up right um, where you sort of, sort of start thinking. Just, I was just thinking about the last question whether you know era seven maybe could be produced by AFS. I mean, it's not. It, it's a bit crazy, but it's it, maybe not for era seven, but sort of you could imagine that then AI models might be able to produce their own analysis data sets and that would be really cool. But yeah, no, there's no AI in era six, not anything like this. Um, I think there are a couple of parameterizations maybe in the model that have some aspects of ML, but not anything like this. Um, uh, and yeah, Storm, no, Storm Eunice isn't in the data set. Um, so what I would say, I think maybe I was a bit misleading. So ERA-5 is a reanalysis data set that is paid for um, by the European Union, I think. Um, it's, it's a European Union, produced by Copernicus, which is a European Union project. Um, and so it's freely available to anybody to download. Um, 
And so, uh, yeah, so anybody can train on era five. I think mainly your limitation with training on era five is um, it's a big data set and you have to have the, the storage capacity even just to download it. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, but we do do, so in AIFS, one of the things that we maybe do a bit differently is we train on era five because that's 40 years of consistent data, but then we fine tune it on um, our operational analysis, which is, um, uh, but the thing is that the operational model is always changing. So we don't have a consistent data set, which makes it a little bit harder, but for fine tuning. So that's when you basically have most of your model, but you just want to change it. By, uh, sort of freeze most of it and then just work on specific part of it. Um, yeah, we can get away with using the operational analysis, which is quite cool. Good. Thank you for that. Um, there are a couple of questions around uh, the verification. Mm -hmm. So one of them is how much of the improved error scores comes from the smoother forecasts? Mm -hmm. And the other one is why are the model skill metrics against the CMWF data, which is predominantly used for training as well, should the models not be evaluated against the OPS? Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, I keep on taking the last question first, but yeah, there's definitely. So we, I mean, when we evaluate our own numerical model, we evaluate it against uh, the sure. ECMWF analysis. Well, our, we are evaluate it against own analysis. So that's sort of the standard practice of the numerical model. Um, but it's definitely true that you we also evaluate against observations. And so um, when we're looking at the models, this is something that we do. And this is something that maybe, for example, we were looking at GenCast here the other day. Um, we we're reading the papers of the new Google paper. And we were saying, yeah, this is interesting to see how it's performing, but how does it perform against observation? So definitely that's something that we consider. We look at, we try and look at both. And um, uh, one of the things about the new version of our model is that it it's doing better against observations at the surface and something we're kind of, we're happy with. Um, although I also should emphasize that all of these models are evaluated on years of era five or years of analysis that they haven't seen so most people train it up to 2017 and then they test it uh well they test it in real time in 2022 2023 um things like that um in terms of verification so this is what we were trying to show in these plots of how much the error is coming from the smoothness so i don't know if i can go back um so that's this plot here so what we're trying to show here is that it's not actually that much smoother than the numerical forecast. So um, it's it's not that all of, so basically uh, that's why we plotted the ensemble mean. So the ensemble mean is a really smooth forecast and you, that's the pink line. And you can see that it improves the error, but this is not what we want. We don't want the ensemble mean um, because it's just a smooth forecast. Um, and so that's what we're trying to show here is that it's not just if it was a really smooth forecast, you'd actually get more improvement in error. Um, and so it's not all coming from smoothness at all. Um, in fact, it's probably about has probably about the same level of smoothness as, as our numerical forecast. And I think there was a, another question, but I've forgotten, I'm afraid, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I think I think we we can move on. Um, so there's an, um, a question quite quite interesting about um, um, going going forward in time. So looking ahead into uh, sub seasonal seasonal kind of climate scales. Mm -hmm. So the question is another forecast challenge for the current AI models is sub seasonal and beyond. How does ECMWF envision future in this direction? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's very, very interesting. And this is actually something when we were when I was talking about those, um, actually, it's exactly this plot, the biases in Pangu, when we saw that it was getting worse as we went out to longer uh, forecast times, we were like, okay, this is not good uh, for if we want to go into the sub-seasonal direction. Um, but yeah, it's definitely an open research question. And we have somebody working on it um, already. And there's actually a, a job offer out at the moment or a job posting exactly for this to work on AI with sub-seasonal forecasting. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it, we've tried it already. We just tried to take our model out to 20 day forecast times just to see what it looks like. Um, and obviously it is a different challenge. Um, and then I think climate is a whole different challenge again, because climate, um, you know, the training data becomes complicated. So I think generally, 
so we we don't work in climate, so we wouldn't have an AI climate model. But I think generally when we talk about it, um, just at coffee and things, um, we would say that you need physical constraints, I think, if you want an AI climate model. Um, but subseasonal, I think, is doable. Um, and it's something that we're definitely thinking about. Yeah, I guess that kind of leads us into the, the next question, which is looking at the future trajectory mm -hmm. of AI-based forecasting. Uh, so one of the questions is, can they be fine-tuned effectively to forecast, for, in, for instance, solar and wind power and generation? So essentially, how do you envision uh, that these kinds of models, these new generation models, uh, will evolve into the future. As you've seen, as you've talked in the beginning, also the we seem to be transitioning from the sort of transformer technology to graph technology. Mm -hmm. uh, we, it, is that is that the direction that um, that we we're going to see, or are things going to shift again? Just kind of interested to hear your your vision on that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So actually, it's it's interesting. So the, yeah, we shifted transformer to graph, but now GenCast and actually our, our new version of our model is a graph transformer. So I think transformers are definitely not out yet. Um, I think we're probably shifting back towards them. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think actually that's probably where these models, this in terms of fine tuning for solar and wind energy, they have the most potential almost because you can't fine tune a global numerical model just for wind energy it's just not it's not feasible but taking one of these models and take, putting it in a sort of limited domain um and then fine tuning it uh, towards your application i think that's very very doable um and i think uh, so we have um uh, member states so these are the flags that are at the bottom of the screen um who are involved in projects um and sort of uh, there's a group of people, uh, countries working together to do these limited area models. So basically taking something like a global AIFS model and making it into a regional model, which could then be definitely used for wind energy applications or, fi or fine tuned for wind energy. We have to see how it works because all of these models so far are global and they're large in scale, but I think there's scope for limited area definitely. Uh, so there's an, a kind of a follow up question about that, which is um, asking if for example, um, certain diagnostics are quite useful for, for the energy sector, like 100 meter mm -hmm. winds or yeah. hub height winds. Would that be potentially available as we move probably into higher resolution, into more features? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, at the moment, um, so this is definitely being explored. There are people exploring this, so going beyond the era five reanalysis data set to data analysis data sets, which have these variables, maybe not specifically 100 meter wind speeds, but but if you have a data set which has these data, this data in it, that it's something to be explored, but we don't, we think it should be fine. Uh, and taking the uh, sort of pre-trained version of the model and then fine tuning it on other variables, we don't anticipate that there's gonna be a big problem, but I think that could be, so if I think in the next year or two, we'll have answers to that, um, yeah. And I, I think one of the speakers uh, is going to talk about limited area uh, models, and so they might be able to answer a bit better than me as well. Yes. Um, quite an interesting question about uh, probabilistic forecasts. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what's your idea uh, for uh, uh, about the future of going probabilistic? So how would that look like? What, what mm -hmm. are the kind of the requirements for that to happen? Yeah. Yeah. So I think the future of probabilistic is, is, is I think this will be the year of probabilistic AI models. Um, so I think most people, including us, including uh, GenCast or DeepMind, are going down the idea of injecting noise somehow and then just working out how you shape that noise. So our approach, uh, well, we're not sure which approach to look at, but the approach uh, for sure, yeah, but the approaches that, that I put on the screen, so you could either, um, so you could have the the GenCast approach where you inject noise and then you use it, the diffusion model basically to denoise it and add the state. Or you can try and inject noise into your model and um, train towards one of these diagnostics or scores that you know you want to achieve. Um, so I think there's both of these approaches are quite, uh, people quite like them. That you could also imagine something like a, a variational autoencoder as well, something like that maybe. I think it'll be the year there'll be lots of cool things. This conversation in six months time would be completely different, but definitely somehow taking in, putting in noise, right? And shaping it. I think originally maybe some people thought, okay, maybe you could train towards the ensemble. 
Um, but I don't think that's really computationally efficient or even really worth it. Um, I think the way forward is definitely to try and, uh, some generative method, I think. Excellent, thank you. Um, there's kind of a similar question, but from the sort of uh, operational perspective, um, uh, some concerns about making this real time, uh, mm -hmm. you know, timely available forecasts. Yeah. Um, how would that kind of transition to, um, yeah, to, 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 to the operational, to operational systems? Uh, mm -hmm. Again, what, what would that entail? Yeah, so that's kind of already done, actually. Um, so those charts that I showed you, um, uh, ECMWF, where we have those models, those models are produced um, in real time, just as, so we call them, well, they are. If you go on charts and look, it says experimental. They are experimental. We're not sort of committing to anything yet, but they are very much in the operational pipeline. It's really just a question of once we're happy with it, we would, it, they could be made operational. So actually I got asked this question the other day, so I double checked with our operator and, and they are released, at least AIFS is released at the same time IFS is. So the numerical forecast and the AI forecast come out at the same time. And probably I imagine, I don't know, given that IFS takes three hours and our model takes one minute, I'm guessing that AIFS actually waits for IFS. So it could be that the AI model would be released before, but I don't know what that would mean politically. That would be that would have to be a decision uh, that would be made. But yeah, in terms of operational, there's no issues at all. Um, it's already done. Yeah. Um, so I, I suppose one of one of the challenges is uh, data assimilation. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a question. If I understand understood well, the assimilation of available data, i.e., um, uh, met stations, etc., is done indirectly through the reanalysis. Is that correct? Um, is it invisible to integrate directly in the learning process the available data? Uh, yeah, so the observation, so the reanalysis data, so when we construct the reanalysis, we take the observations uh, and there's a sort of a numerical, yeah, there's a data assimilation process with the numerical model um, and we try and construct our sort of best guess. So so that part of it, there's no sort of stepping forwards in time. That's more sort of spatial interpolation of all the observations into a gridded field that, that we can use. Um, and it definitely there are there's, so there's a paper from Google's which is MetNet three I think where they try and integrate observations into their neural network um, data assimilation I think I think the next steps will be so uh, step one is the ensemble we have GenCast now I mean it's not not a finished prod like it's not okay GenCast now we're done um, and there's there'll be lots and lots of ensemble papers I think this year. Um, then I think the next step will probably be sub-seasonal forecasting. And then after that, I mean, but people are already working on data simulation. But I think that's probably of the three of the three sort of scientific problems that we have. I think that's the data simulation will be the hardest one. But I'm sure that we'll get there. There'll, there are people, we're very clever people already working on it. So it's only a matter of time. Um, yeah. Yes. Um Another really um, good point um, about, um, I would say, probably physics informed versus end to end machine learning. The question is is there a way that physical conservation laws can still be replicate, replicated by ML based models? Uh, I, I suppose what they mean is a physics informed neural networks aren't yet tuned for weather predictions. Has ECMWF looked into that? Yeah, so. Uh... Physics, in, uh, so we haven't really looked at physics informed neural networks. I mean, if we, we'd been having this conversation two years ago, or maybe even, a, no, maybe even a year ago, just up, just before GraphCast, basically, we probably thought the physics informed and uh, hybrid modeling, that's what we were focusing on. Uh, but in the end, when we look at, um, uh, when you look at these models, you can see that they are, uh, doing a reasonable job of representing the physics. I'm very aware of the person who's speaking after me. So and maybe that's a question for him as well. Um, so we don't see the need uh, for these sorts of lead times, forecast times to to introduce physics and uh, physical constraints at the moment. That's not to say that this is still very, very new. I mean, AIFS has been around for, for two or three months. Um, so it's not to say that in a year or two's time, we might look at it and think, actually, yeah, we do need um, physical constraints or we do need some sort of physics informed neural network. Obviously, neural GCM was very interesting with its its hybrid nature. Um, 
So that was that. I'm sure there are lots of people who are working on that, continuing to develop it. It's not something we're doing at ACMWF, but yeah, we're we're always watching with interest and seeing what people are up to. Yes, um, I'm conscious of time. I think we'll just uh, uh, get a final round of, of questions now. Um, uh, quite a few questions around um, how how is coherency ensured when you have um, data from different sources or so different resolutions, um, mm -hmm. radar combined with satellite combined with yeah. uh, ground observations. How is that? How is that managed technically? I suppose from kind of the more technical point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, how is that managed within an AI model, I guess, is an open question. We don't know yet. Uh, in ACMWF, what we have, or well, any any system, any data assimilation system, you have basically different. Uh, so I'm not a data assimilation expert at all, but I know that they have like these different parts of the model that sort of feed in uh, different parts of observations and, and pre-process them and deal with them and put them through the physical process. But but how do you replicate that with AI? It's a big open question. How exactly this coherency of sources is going to be a huge problem of how you deal with it. Is it that you have the same thing instead of trying to replicate the whole data assimilation in one go? You have different components, maybe, and then they all feed in together. Um, I don't know. That, that's, that's a big question, I think. Thank you, Mariana. Um, I'd like to thank the speaker one more time. I think it's been a really insightful talk and particularly the uh, um, all the questions and the, the answers we had. Um, Greg, I think now it's time for a quick break. Is that right? Okay, so time is now 36 past. Um, so we'll... Moving on, so our next speaker is uh, Gregory Hakim from the University of Washington. He's going to talk about dynamical tests of deep learning weather prediction model. Um, Gregory, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning from Seattle. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you today. Yes, yeah, so my collaborator here on this work is Sanjit Mesanam. He uh, was a high school student working with me on the early stages of this work, and he's now a freshman majoring in physics. Uh, so the motivation, as we heard about in the uh, the last presentation, is we had this massive rise in deep learning models for global numerical weather prediction. And over the past uh, year and a half or so, we've seen these models produce forecast skill uh, comparable to or even better than uh, the IFS. And this is opening up a lot of new opportunities. Uh, for example, the most obvious one uh, that Mariano talked about is large ensembles. So the question I'm going to address uh, in this talk is how, to what extent these models have encoded uh, physics. And we're going to look at that from idealized numerical experiments uh, in an out-of-sample context. With the goal of being, can these models be used for basic science like our physics models can? And also, can they be used for data simulation? That's another project that I'm uh, working on, uh, but I won't be talking about uh, today. So taking a step back uh, even broader than in the previous talk, I think one of the most important results of the last decade with these deep learning models is the scaling laws uh, that first emerged with the large language models. Uh, this is a paper from 2020 uh, from a team at Deep uh, at uh, OpenAI. And what it shows is that uh, as you scale up the models from small models with a thousand parameters uh, with these top lines here, uh, to a billion parameters with the models at the bottom uh, as a function of the size of the, the training data, the number of tokens processed along the abscissa. So the loss is on the ordinate, and of course, lower values are better. What you see is this, what to me and many people was very counterintuitive in the early days. If you think about linear models, with a given amount of data, adding more parameters is the reverse of what you should be doing uh, because you don't have enough data to constrain them. But with the nonlinear aspects of these models, adding more parameters actually improves the performance. So you get better performance on smaller data sets, and then you get uh, ultimately more accurate models uh, when you have a ton of training data. And there's recent evidence that this also applies to dynamical systems uh, like atmospheric uh, dynamics. This is an example from a recent paper uh, by Gilpin looking at 135 low-order dynamical systems 
and 24 different uh, training techniques. And the upshot here is that in a similar figure, essentially having uh, the error as a function of the amount of training data that's used, the large model, learning model shown here in the colors, have the same characteristic of performing better with smaller amounts of training data. And even at the, um, the largest amounts of training data used, they're still not saturated, uh, which is the case for the smaller models. So yeah, there's there's been a huge flurry of a, of interest and results in this area. I, I won't uh, spend too much on time on this since it was shown in the previous slide. I guess the bottom line for me is that these global models that have skill comparable to the IFS they're now a commodity. Uh, you know, they were when they first came out, it was it was shocking, but now there's there's so many that most individual investigators have too many to work with. And I think again, a larger point here is that. This is not just a rotation of interest within our own field on different modeling techniques. Uh, the influx of these teams represents large net growth in the talent pool to advance the science of numerical weather prediction. And this, along with the computational advances, will accelerate progress in this area. That, that's my own personal view. So some work on uh, these deep learning models and their physical capabilities. This was a, a, a slide from a Really nice paper by Massimo Bonavita, looking at the Pangu weather model and looking at the power spectral density of the model in a number of variables like 850 hectopascal temperature uh, and then wind at 850 hectopascals on the lower left. Uh, the power spectrum, so large scales on the left, uh, small scales on the right. Uh, these upper curves right here show you the ERI-5 reanalysis and essentially the, the IFS as well is, is fairly close to that. These dashed lines show you the performance from Pangu weather. And what you see in all these figures is that at large scales, the model has essentially the same power as does the data it was trained upon. Uh, but at small scales, increasingly as you go to small scales, there's a reduction in power. And the reason for that is that the model is, is being trained on predictable scales. Uh, and this, these small scales, especially at longer leads, are effectively noise and minimizing the root mean square error leads to the smoothing effect that we see. So if you're interested in things like power production, where especially for wind and solar, uh, small scales are important. You should keep in mind that in addition to this deterministic piece, if you wanna have an estimate of the error, uh, as we do with, with other statistical models, you need to have something like a stochastic model that um, introduces the unpredictable components of the error. So again, the, the topic I'm going to get into here is uh, to what extent these models have encoded physics. Previous studies are mostly analyzing the forecast error. And uh, the thing that I get from most of these papers is that they're really curious to see if they can beat the IFS. That's the driving motivation. And it's to me, it's it's very similar to the race to improve test scores uh, for the LLMs. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take something that's akin to a Green's function approach, which is an efficient way to look at whether these models have uh, captured physical processes uh, by localizing disturbances in an idealized sense in space and time and to see how that disturbance evolves. And the reason for that is that signal propagation is determined by physics in the linear limit, the group velocity limits the spread of a signal on the space-time plane illustrated in this cartoon on the right. So uh, this could be longitude along the x-axis and then time along the y-axis. Initially, localized disturbance in the linear sense spreads out. The leading edge is determined by the maximum group velocity and the trailing edge by the minimum group velocity, and then the peak moves with the, either the peak amplitude for a neutral system or if there's an unstable wave that dominates the peak. So it's an efficient way to test all scales at once and whether the model captures the spread of uh, spatially localized signals. So the design here can be summed up uh, in one equation. I'm going to use the Pangu weather model represented here by N, so the state vector at some time t uh, goes forward uh, one time in the future, time step one. We could do this autorecursively. In addition to that, I have two other contributions. One 
is meant to uh, maintain that the state that I'm going to put these perturbations on is itself a steady solution of Pangu weather. And in another experiment I'm gonna talk about, we're going to introduce a forcing which is external to the model, a heating field, and see how the model responds to the external force. So again, the idea here is that we're going to have a steady state that we are going to perturb and look at the response of the Pangu weather solutions. Uh, the experiments I'm going to show you are classic in geophysical fluid dynamics. We're going to look at a uh, tropical heat source. This is really important, especially for S2S prediction, MGO, NCO. There is the production of extratropical planetary waves, which are the main source of predictability on those time scales. So we'd like to see how the model responds to that in a situation where we can control the heating. We'll look at idealized bare clinic development in the mid latitudes, and then a really hard problem, uh, the geostrophic adjustment problem where we perturb the system away from uh, geostrophic and hydrostatic balance. Uh, in the interest of time, I don't think I'll have time to talk about uh, the work on Atlantic hurricanes that we've done. So for the tropical heating experiment, uh, we put a localized heat source in the tropics uh, near the Western warm pool in the tropical Pacific. We do this on the December, January, February mean state. It's a spatially localized heat source over all layers in the atmosphere, uh, 0.1 Kelvin per day, steady heating. Going back to the early 90s, this is a famous experiment where you get these uh, radiating uh, planetary waves from the heat source into the extratropics. Again, this is the main source of predictive skill on subseasonal and seasonal time scales associated with tropical heating. On the right, we see another classical experiment localized more to the heating itself in the tropics, the so-called Matsuno Gill response, uh, a mixed response between uh, Kelvin waves on the equator and off equator uh, Rossby waves. So here are the results from Pangu weather. The gray contours here show you the 500 hectopascal heights for the DJF mean. And we're gonna see the perturbations from that uh, in the Pangu weather model in the colors. The heating distribution is shown here by uh, the dashed red line. This is at five days, 10 days, and 20 days. Uh, the contra interval was increasing there. The steady heating uh, strikes a resonant response uh, with the stationary waves in the model. And you see something which is very familiar if you if you're if you're uh, you know the, the this work and the, the figure I showed you previously. We get these uh, radiating planetary waves which go into the extratropics along the waveguides in the mid-latitude jet streams, and uh, they propagate downstream. If you look close to the heat source itself, here again is the heating. This is the wind field at 850 hectopascals, and you could see this. Uh, Easterly flow coming into the heating from the right, westerly flow on the right side. And then we have these off equator gyres, cyclonic gyres uh, in either hemisphere, which looks a lot like uh, the idealized uh, shallow water result uh, for the Matsuno Gill model shown down below. It qualitatively has the same exact features. A lot of the details here are simply because Pangu weather knows about uh, the topography and the land ocean contrast, which are absent in this model. So this was the first experiment we did. I found this really surprising that uh, the model can reproduce uh, something that's a basic um, experiment in large scale dynamics. Moving downscale a little bit now, looking at baroclinic development, uh, I'm gonna show you results for a localized precursor disturbance on uh, the Pacific jet stream in winter time. So we're gonna have the DJF, uh, mean state, once again, I make that steady. And then uh, for the initial condition, we're gonna have a localized disturbance like an upper level trough over the upstream end of the storm track. And I produce that field by regressing all uh, fields on the ERA-5 uh, geopotential height, 500 hectopascals at 40 degrees north, 150 degrees east. And then this is hor horizontally localized with a function as compact support so that it goes to zero at 2000 kilometers. So it's a truly localized disturbance. And the idea here is again, uh, turning to what we expect theoretically, uh, we expect from the ED model that this disturbance is going to spread as it goes downstream. Uh, theoretically, we, we expect this exponential decrease 
in the amplitude as we go downstream. So-called downstream development as the waves radiate across the Pacific. Uh, we expect shorter wavelengths at the leading edge and then longer waves uh, and deeper waves as we get to the center of the packet where the baroclinic development uh, is deepest. Observations show this as well. So if you look at a large composite of uh, surface specific cyclones that form over the Western Pacific, uh, and you look at the response at the jet stream level, you get this uh, wave packet response, which you see here in the, the meridional wind field uh, in the heavy contours, and then the potential vorticity field in the thin contours, uh, showing you the waveguide that the waves are propagating along the Pacific Ocean. And then uh, this is two days before peak cyclone intensity. And then if you go two days later, you see the whole packet has moved downstream uh, toward North America. Okay, so here are the results uh, for the Pangu weather experiment. Uh, this shows you two fields in the blue contours. We have uh, the mean sea level uh, pressure field. And in the color fill, you'll see uh, the specific humidity field at 850 hectopascals. So I'll just put this into motion. You see an extratropical cyclone development, low pressure intensifies. You have enhanced uh, water vapor uh, in the uh, greenish areas, a reduction in the uh, mixing ratio in the brown areas. Uh, so going back to kind of an earlier time here, you see this classic a hook shape, which, which you expect to see in satellite imagery, uh, a dry slot, uh, the cloud distribution you can imagine would be like so, a very realistic looking frontal structure. We also have this interesting appearance of another cyclone developing upstream. It turns out this one is more shallow, uh, but also evolves in a similar fashion as we go later in time. And then yet another one uh, a few days later. So we get a family of cyclones as the system propagates across the Pacific Ocean. If you look at, um, let's see if I can get to the next one here. So this shows you the mean sea level pressure once again uh, here in the black dashed contours. And then we have the temperature anomalies in uh, color contours. So blue is cold, red is warm. And so you see, if I can stop it here at a particular time. Here we see, and the, the winds are shown in the, the green arrows, cyclonic flow around the area of low pressure, as you would expect. But again, there's, there's no physical constraints in this model. So gradient wind balance has emerged as uh, a learned property uh, during the training process. You can see a very nice wind shift along the cold front, warm air in the warm sector, cold air behind the cold front, uh, deformation field, kind of the classic uh, hyperbolic deformation along the cold front, um, as you might expect. Looking up at 500 hectopascals, here's the trough at upper levels that kicks the whole thing off. Uh, we have, again, a gradient wind balance between uh, the low geopotential heights in the trough. And then as we go forward in time, you can see uh, the trough move across the Pacific Ocean and you can see this wave packet develop as this disturbance uh, disperses with shorter waves moving downstream and these longer waves upstream. Again, theoretically, that's exactly what we expect. And in fact, uh, if you take this and make it even more idealized and look at the zonal mean. So what I've done here is I've taken the wintertime average and I've zonally averaged it as well. So now the DJF zonal mean is given by these, uh, and the geopotential height is given by these uh, these gray lines. Put a disturbance on there, let it go. We're just looking at 500 hectopascal heights. Now you can see the disturbance radiates downstream. Again, at all times, we have a very realistic uh, relationship between the height and the wind. Uh, we have the shorter wavelengths downstream uh, going to longer waves upstream, which again is what we find with physics-based models and observations and uh, also the theoretical expectation. Looking at the simulated wave packet structure after six days, uh, this is what it looks like in the meridional wind field as a function of longitude. 
we have this exponential profile uh, in the amplitude to the peak at the center of the packet. And again, comparing that with observations, uh, it's qualitatively very similar. Moving on now to the hardest problem that we've looked at uh, is geostrophic adjustment. And this is the evolution of the pressure and wind field to something like geostrophic or gradient wind balance. Uh, theoretically, gravity wave radiation uh, moves away from the disturbance and we get um, an evolution toward the slower Rossby waves where we have the relationship between um, pressure and wind. This is typically illustrated with what's called the dam break problem where you start off with uh, some anomaly in the pressure field and uh, no wind and then the wind uh, evolves toward a state of balance which is not easy to configure in a full physics model because there are very large initial tendencies. So this is a challenge for any model. And what I'm going to do here is an initial condition that's very similar to what I just showed you for the extratropical cyclone, except we're just going to perturb the 500 hectopascal height. So every other variable at every other level is unperturbed. And so uh, that's a very a state that's very far from geostrophic and hydrostatic balance, and we'll see how it adjusts going forward in time. In the interest of time, I'm just going to show you a result uh, for a case on the equator. So the blue contours here show you that we have low geopotential heights initially on the equator. The green dots show you that the wind is calm everywhere. And if we go forward in time, uh, let's see here. Just take it one step forward, maybe not. Uh, this is one hour in the future. So the initial response of the model is convergence on the low heights, which is exactly what we expect. If we step that forward a little further, you can see the divergent flow increases, the convergent flow on uh, the point of lowest height. The height rises with that convergence. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that these wind arrows are rotating to the right in the Northern Hemisphere, and they're rotating to the left in the Southern Hemisphere. And the rate of rotation is larger off the equator than it is on the equator. There's effectively no rotation on the equator. So the Coriolis turning has a realistic time scale with respect to latitude. And I'll let this go out. This goes out to 24 hours. The very end there, there's a shift because there's two, there's actually three different versions of the Pangu weather model we're using right here. They've been trained for different time steps and the solutions are similar, but there's definitely a jump in time as you go from one model to the other. Okay, so I am going to skip over uh, hurricane development in the interest of time and go to the conclusion. So we have uh, time for a discussion. So a lot of these comparisons were qualitative. Uh, I was really just curious about whether uh, these models, how they would respond uh, for initial conditions that didn't look anything like the data that they were trained upon. And I would say I was quite surprised, and these are promising results, that it appears these models have encoded a wide range of physics despite having no uh, explicit constraints. Although direct comparisons with physics models would obviously be uh, a logical and important next step from here. There are clearly some issues and some missing physics. This damping of small scales or smoothing uh, is apparent. And that's because these models are designed for predictable signals, not for unpredictable signals. Um, and the, the dynamics of Pangu weather seem to be somewhat overly localized. That is, they're, they're lacking some of these large scale waves that radiate away. We didn't see too much of that, which turns out to be advantageous for the experiments that I've designed. So we have this issue of predictable signals versus what you might call complete dynamics, which you would get from a physics-based model. That is, there is this tension between stochastic and deterministic components, which I think um, we'll have to wrestle with for a full representation of uncertainty in ensembles with these models. And this is a, a problem that we wrestle with, again, with the, with the physics models as well. They have similar challenges uh, in, in calibration. And finally, I'll leave you with a, a little bit of an outlook and speculation on my part. I think these tools really provide us with a path for a new approach to science where one can use these models uh, for hypothesis testing over a wide range of uh, candidate uh, solutions and initial conditions. 
and then use the results from that process of discovery uh, for simulations with the more expensive uh, physics models. These tools allow for very large ensembles, which is what I'm working with for data simulation. Uh, they also have built in in the frameworks, adjoint models and automatic differentiation, which is gonna open up a whole host of other novel applications. So these models are gonna get bigger, they're gonna get more accurate and they're gonna get fine tuned for custom applications like regional refinement, uh, physical constraints and uh, potentially overcome the, the data limitations we have of just training on ERA-5. Uh, so there's a paper on archive, it's uh, in review, and uh, I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg, that was quite a fascinating talk. Um, I just want to remind everyone that you can post your questions on the chat or on Slido. Um, we have a question. Um, it says, any thoughts on directly comparing the idealized simulations by a physical model, um, an AI model, um, any obstacles and the opportunities related to that? Yeah, as I say, I think that's an important next step. Uh, one thing I'll highlight is that uh, I only gained access to the Pangu weather model last June, the end of last June, and I did this work uh, over the summer and the paper was submitted in September. There's no way in the world I could have done that with a physics-based model. I could not have done any one of these initial value problems with a physics-based model uh, at the speed with which I did th this whole range of experiments with the Pangu weather model. So it's just, it's an illustration of the power of these tools and the speed at which they allow us to evaluate solutions. So I think anybody who takes this challenge up of directly comparing these simulations, these idealized simulations with a physics-based model, it's likely gonna take more time, especially for that geostrophic adjustment problem. This is essentially a shock where the model is off its attractor, there'll be a fast response with acoustic and gravity waves. And that, that can be a, a real challenge for um, the physics-based models. A lot of dissipation we have in those models is to deal with uh, damping away things like that. So yeah, it's an important next step, but it's one that's probably gonna take more time the one I devoted for these experiments. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a question. Um, so um, I, I, I probably missed this in your presentation. What was sort of the um, uh, the training data that you've used? We're more thinking about stepping into the future. What data would be required to improve the accuracy of these models, improve the predictability of of of, of and stop tracks and extreme events. Um, how do you see that this is uh, this this will go um, within the next few months or, or year? Yeah. To be clear, um, I just used the released weights from Pangu Weather. I did no special fine tuning, nothing of the sort. I just designed my experiment so that I could put an input into Pangu Weather and get an output. So it was autoregressive inference uh, in the usual way. And I just designed the experiments to look at these particular idealized uh, initial value experiments. In terms of where it's going, what I'm most excited about, I'm, I'm a data simulation expert, and um, I'm extremely excited about these tools for assimilation. The fact that I can run 100 or 1,000 ensemble members, which is two or three orders of magnitude larger than operational NWP, and I can do that as a single individual, uh, and I could do that with the same skill as the operational models is, is an absolute, it's a massive breakthrough. So we're exploring using these tools for ensemble data simulation. And it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see that when you start running with a thousand or 10,000 ensemble members, a lot of the challenges we have had to deal with in the past in ensemble data simulation with sample error, uh, they're not the same. Uh, so things change dramatically and I hope to report uh, more on that in the near future. But that's where I'm going in the next <laughs> present in the near future. Really exciting. Be looking forward to, to hear more news about that. Um, next question. Any thoughts on directly comparing the idealized simulations? Um, uh, no, sorry. Um, if we train AI models with higher resolution training data, can we improve on the lack of high frequency energy content issue? Yeah, that's a really important question. I think especially for this group whose interest is in 
I guess, largely renewables, predicting 10 or 100 meter wind speeds and solar power generation, so sky and downward radiation. There is this issue of predictable signals versus unpredictable signals. And these models are, as I've mentioned, they're only capturing the predictable signals. So that, so if you're interested in small scales, the, the lifetime of, of uh, the skill at those small scales may be limited, but it still might be there. So you may get six hours of predictive skill and that probably has uh, use if you're trying to balance the load on a, on a power grid, for example. Uh, if you're interested in planning and going out for uh, days or weeks, then you're going to lose that power. And as I said, I think you're going to need, at least with this generation of the models, to introduce that uncertainty that's lost because they're they're not learning things that they cannot uh, predict. They're only learning things that are predictable. But one can, as we do with linear inverse models, there's a deterministic piece and then there's a calibrated stochastic piece such that at long lead times, uh, the stochastic piece dominates and we cover climatological variance, for example, that that is the, the fo forecast error matches the climatological variance. So there's there's nothing stopping doing something similar uh, with these models. And I think that'll be necessary to have uh, spread skill relationships that are accurate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, quite an interesting question, actually. I, I, I have I had the same question. Um, so obviously you've looked into um, using Pangu weather. Um, the question is, um, are you, do you expect to do similar tests in other AI models? Uh, so do you, do you expect other data-driven models to have similar behavior as Pangu, even if their architecture is quite different, uh, graph gas, for example? Uh, it's a very interesting question. Yes, uh, I originally started off with uh, ForecastNet from NVIDIA, and uh, the results there were not so good uh, because I think this, this Fourier network in the zonal direction only was a bit problematic for localized disturbances. There was aliasing, and there was quickly a global response in the signal. So this is... Uh, good performance on these experiments is not a given. It's not a guarantee. It, does seem to depend perhaps a little bit on the network itself. I have not tested other models beyond that. I was working with ForecastNet originally because that was the first one where there were open weights. And then when Pangu weather came out and we started getting these really good results, um, my research is focused on using that model. But yeah, it probably does depend to some extent on uh, the structure of the network in these models. Yeah, I suppose a follow-up question is how, how could we ensure rigorous verification and fair verification across the board um, because obviously people are concerned about the reliability um, and the representation of truth. Um, so yeah, I suppose that's still kind of an open question uh, for, for discussion amongst the community. Um, obviously we, 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 we do have um, a criteria within the meteorological community, but as we bring in other other areas, then perhaps the, we should start opening these channels of communication for understanding between um, between metrics, between you know skill scores and things like that. And how can we ensure that we're benchmarking models in a fair way? Um, so the next question is, how do you expect your findings to generalize uh, to other machine learning models, in particular to models using other architectures? Uh, such as, uh, so sorry, so that was the previous one. Um, can you speculate, um, uh, is the performance of ML models uh, mostly due to that uh, they have learned uh, the physics or rather that they rely on statistical relationships? Yeah, that was the essential motivating drive behind these experiments. I wanted to know, they've only seen these complex rich fields uh, that you have in ERA-5. If you look at any day in ERA-5, you don't see the smooth average state um, that I've used as the background for these experiments. So that was the idea, is if they've really learned physics, they should be able to handle disturbances that don't look like what we see on any given day in the ERA-5. So once the paper uh, is accepted for publication, I'll of course release uh, all of the code and uh, the methods on 
GitHub. I already have a repository there. And so anybody could take this and apply these tests to their model. And I, I'd really like to see something like that as the standard evaluation procedure while these models are being developed, not just this, can we, can we beat IFS, but look a little deeper into the performance of the model in these initial value experiments for the ones that we've conducted here, but there's plenty of others too, that one can use to assess the performance of the model and whether it's capturing um, physical behavior as, as one would expect. Yeah, um, there is a, a question about kind of a clarification question. What does the result in geostrophic adjustment test signify for operational weather forecast? Yeah, so uh, this happens, especially at relatively high resolution near convective events. Um, you do see this geostrophic adjustment or in extreme situations where you have um, large gradients in the wind speed. Uh, there is often some adjustment to geostrophic balance. So the, the point is that we, we know this happens in our physics models. Uh, it's not as dramatic as what I showed in these idealized experiments, but this this evolution toward balance is constantly happening in the real system. And the question is, does a deep learning model, which has not been conditioned uh, to behave those physical laws, does it capture that, that process? Does it have turning under the action of uh, geostrophic adjustment from the Coriolis effect? Uh, and it seems at least qualitatively uh, that this model does. Thanks, Greg. Um, I suppose in the interest of time, we need to move on. Um, Thank you. Shukanta, do you want to take over? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so the next, so now we are going to kind of zoom in and the next two talks are going to be related to mesoscale and high resolution scales. So the next uh, talk is by Joel Oscarson from Linkoping University, and he's going to talk about uh, neural weather prediction for limited area models. So Joel, if you could share your screen. Uh, yes, thank you. Let me set this up. Uh... There we go. Now I hope you can yeah. see the slides and the sound should be good. All right. Yes. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Joel Oskarsson. I'm a PhD student at Linköping University in Sweden. So I'm going to talk a bit about neural weather prediction for limited area modeling. Uh, so I was, of course, happy to hear some questions around this earlier, because uh, then I can just continue on here and hope to uh, say a bit more about this now. So uh, I should say this is, of course, some work I've done together with others. So uh, Thomas Landelius from the Swedish Meteorology and Hydrology Institute, and also my supervisor, Fredrik Lindsten from Linköping University. Um, so I think we've already got some really nice uh, motivation why these machine learning models are worth paying attention to. And sort of, I think many people are quite convinced that these work really well. Um, and that there is a lot of development in development in this area and has been for a couple of years. I wanted to show my own timeline here with also some models that I think are uh, really interesting and has brought new things. And as you see, it's new models all the time coming out and new ideas. Uh, so it's a really exciting field. Um, one way to categorize these models is based on the kind of machine learning methods underlying them. and. Uh, as I think Mariana pointed out, uh, there can be these uh, two different families, the graph-based models utilizing some type of graph neural networks. And then we also have some transformer-based models that have been popular utilizing different kinds of transformer-based architectures. Uh, but what's been common in this sort of an advancement in recent years is that these models tend to focus on global weather forecasting uh, first and foremost. But the question of actually doing a local forecasting and limited area modeling 
is also something that can be really interesting because many scenarios were not really we don't care about the weather for the whole globe, but we really just want to focus in and do forecasts for some specific area. So the to the natural question here is then, okay, can we build some neural limited area models and can we can we try to leverage these new uh, models and these new kind of architectures that have come out in recent years also for uh, limited area modeling? So what would be the benefits of this? Well, of course, if we want to focus on in on some specific area, we it seems unnecessary to forecast the weather for the whole globe. Rather, we could build some more smaller scale machine learning models uh, only for this area that are computationally cheaper, connecting this to sort of the ensemble forecasting part. If we have smaller, cheaper to run models, we could make maybe even larger ensembles. Um, then, of course, if we focus in on a specific area, typically what we want to do in with limited limited area models, LAM models, uh, is to go to finer resolutions, and also to utilize some of the LAM data sets that are out there, and try to use these to learn some nice machine learning models. So with this kind of motivation, uh, it's what me and my collaborators started at and thought, okay, can we try to build some neural LAM model? So for presenting exactly what we have done, let's go over a little bit to kind of modeling and the core ideas behind using machine learning for NWP. And this will probably be some repetition here of uh, things uh, you might have heard, but I don't think that hurts anyone. Hope I can add some new perspectives. So the way I like to think of this is kind of uh, that we have some kind of weather state xt, so different variables, all the different variables we're interested in modeling, different uh, pressure levels, and also all at all the different uh, spatial locations we're modeling. And then there exists, of course, where we can think of there existing some true type of dynamics model taking us from previous time steps to the next, and we want to approximate this sort of function f with some machine learning model, f hat. And if we have such a machine learning model, we can then apply it to some initial conditions uh, here, x1, to take us to the next time step. And we can keep doing this after regressively to roll out an entire forecast. Um, and I mean, this looks quite similar to traditional NWP. It's just that our f hat here is a machine learning model. What's of course different here is that we need to learn this model. So typically what we need to do is to train on some data set of trajectories of weather states to learn this function f hat. And there one can use different kinds of data. So it's possible to train models on forecast data that come from physics-based models. And then what we end up with is just some sort of really fast surrogate model of the classical system. Uh, that can produce forecast really quickly and energy efficient. Or we can train on reanalysis data, and this is what we've seen being done, uh, training on the ERA-5 data set and so on. And this is really what allows the machine learning models to, on some metrics, even surpass uh, the existing NWP. So just different kinds of frameworks. Um, so what we have been using and we're focusing on for the neural LAM modeling is the graph-based neural weather prediction. So there's many good reasons for this. Um, this being able to sort of, as we keep on building on this framework, handle maybe more irregularly uh, positioned observations and so on is one strong. And also just the sort of success of graph-based uh, weather prediction on a global scale is a strong motivation uh, for following this path, I say. So this will be a little bit of a recap again on graph-based uh, weather modeling. And I think, I hope no one will be sad if you get experts on graph neural networks after this. Uh, but really when, uh, when you wanna build a graph-based model, the first sort of step that you have to do is to construct some kind of mesh graph that will be covering the forecasting area that you're interested in. So if we're talking a global model here, um, then of course, 
this means creating a graph around the entire globe. If it's a limited area model like I will be showing, then it's the forecasting area that you're interested in that you need to construct this mesh graph over. And the really, really the idea of creating this graph is that you typically have a lot of grid cells where your data sits. And it could be very expensive for to run the machine learning model sort of directly on that grid. So you create this mesh graph that has fewer nodes than you have grid cells. And then you perform much of the computations on the mesh graph. And therefore, things get computationally uh, a lot more efficient. So once you have such a mesh graph constructed, the way to actually make a prediction and take you from one time step to the next is based on this encode process decode framework. So really you start with your data. So you're sort of XT sitting at the grid nodes, the orange squares here. You encode this up to this mesh graph that has fewer nodes. Then you do a number of processing steps on the mesh graph and you decode down back again to the grid. Uh, and that then takes you one time step forward from t to t plus 1. And then you repeat this many, many times. And that way, you can then roll out an entire forecast. Um, and I haven't said sort of any of the details here. And really, what, what makes this framework powerful is that all of these different steps are based on graph neural networks. So the encoding step is parameterized as a graph neural network. Each processing step, how these different representations in the nodes are updated uh, is a graph neural network. And that model is then learned during the training process. So you, the model learns how to encode, what to do in each processing step, how to decode, and so on. Um, so that's how uh, these models become powerful and are able to actually achieve the forecasting. So that's sort of the modeling framework that we will build on. Uh, of course, we also needed some data to train this kind of model on. Uh, so the data that we've been using is from the MET Co-op Ensemble Prediction System, or MEPS. So this is a limited area NWP system. Um, the data set is on a 10 kilometer resolution. So it's a 238 times 268 grid that covers this area that you see uh, in the oh, picture to the right. So this is roughly the uh, sort of this Nordic area uh, and some more. So in the data set, so, so I should say the, the idea here with uh, this sort of experiment is can we try to emulate this MEP system with some kind of fast deep learning model? So we will be training it on forecasts from the MEP system and trying to create a really fast, efficient surrogate model of it. In total, we have 6,000 forecasts. This is from around two years of uh, running the system. Uh, each is 57 hours, and we're working with a three-hour time step here. And then we have a number of different variables in the data set, so wind, temperature, water vapor, solar radiation, pressure, geopotential, humidity, cinder. And some of these are at different uh, height levels. Uh, and then we also have some forcing inputs, uh, like a land water mask that's really useful for the model. OK, uh, so then for building our limited area model, the sort of first step here was to actually construct this mesh graph for this MEPS area here. Um, and there we tried a number of different approaches, some things that have been proposed in the literature and some new things. Uh, so the first thing that had been proposed is to build a kind of single resolution mesh where you lay out your nodes and then you connect them to your ne their neighbors. Uh, we call the model using this uh, 1L LAM. Then we also created what's called a multi-scale mesh. Um, so in that, that case, you have nodes uh, both connected to the neighbors, but also these longer connections that are able to transport information longer spatial distances. So this is similar to the GraphCast uh, global model. So we named this one uh, GC LAM. And then finally, we also proposed sort of a, a new approach to this kind of uh, 
uh, mesh-based uh, modeling in uh, the graph-based uh, models. Um, and the idea here was to sort of, instead of laying out just the nodes once and making edges between them, we put the nodes on different hierarchical levels uh, in this kind of structure. And then we connect these levels with additional edges uh, between them. Uh, so this is what we call the high lamb model. And this is a, sort of a, a little bit more of an extension maybe than the multi-scale mesh. So it required us to also change out the graph neural networks evolved a bit. Uh, but I, I'm not gonna go into the details about that, even though I could probably talk about it for a long time. Uh, yes, so that's the kind of mesh graph we've been using. And then the really the other big question when doing limited area modeling is how to handle the boundary. Because as soon as you have a limited area, you will have some boundary conditions. And if you want some form of useful model here, you need to take into account what's going on around the area. Um, so in traditional lab models, uh, typically you use the, uh, some forecast often from a global model as boundary conditions on in your limited area model. Uh, so we wanted to try to sort of adapt this idea to the machine learning models and see, okay, well, how could we do this here? Uh, so we include a sort of boundary forcing as input here at every time step. So the way this looks like in the training is that you, uh, you the model takes in the previous states, the many forcing that you're are using, uh, and then it creates a prediction. And then we take, look at the time that we're predicting. We look up the ground truth state in the data set, so from the ground truth forecast in the data set. We extract just the boundary from that one and we glue these together. And then we end up with sort of the new state again. And then this will then go back into the model uh, at the next time step, and then the model can utilize the information found in the boundary. So of course, if you would to run this up to run this operationally, you couldn't get your boundary from a ground truth uh, like this, but then you would have to get this from some other global forecast uh, and extract the boundary from there and use it in uh, operational settings. Okay, so then we have most of the pieces to build this kind of LAM model. Um, so we sort of implemented this and trained some models. And these are some example results, some forecasts. This is for uh, the net long wave solar radiation and one of the wind components here. Uh, so what I show here in the animations is sort of the ground truth forecast here and the prediction from the model started then from the same uh, initial conditions. So we see that while the, the model is capturing a lot of the sort of uh, overall patterns, these kind of smoothing problems is uh, definitely a, a big thing uh, that we observe immediately. One thing we also had a lot of issues with was uh, in the GC LAM model, we saw all of these artifacts. It might be visible on the image to the left here, but it's probably most clear uh, to the right. Uh, so you can see that there's these kind of circular artifacts around some of the nodes in the mesh graph. So that's the white, dot, white dots here uh, that appeared. And this isn't very nice, sort of, if you wanted to present these forecasts to someone. Uh, it's not something you would want in there. And luckily, with this hierarchical high lamb model, we were able to uh, mostly get rid of those. And we can also compare these different uh, models uh, uh, numerically. And look at this is the RMSE for uh, V component of the wind and the water vapor. So we can see here that the sort of single scale 1L lamb model is uh, performing quite a lot worse, and the high lamb model uh, has a slight edge in this case. Okay. So I wanted to wrap up with a little. Oh, yeah, I should say this also. So we. we put our implementation of all of this also on GitHub um, openly in a repository that we call Neuralam. So if anyone is interested to sort of play around with limited area machine learning models here, it's a PyTorch implementation you can uh, try out. 
and I try to maintain this uh, and add sort of new things as we keep doing work in this area. And there's also other people who started using this for other data sets. So it's uh, going to be very exciting to see uh, what people uh, end up doing. But yeah, so, so I wanted to wrap up uh, with a little bit of outlook here, also talking about uh, specifically the limited area modeling and what I think is uh, the big future steps for neural LAM models, given this uh, experiments that we've been doing. So I think the, the big question here is really, how do we connect the global models and the LAM models? Um, so we did this very simple thing where we used the uh, boundary forcing from a global model. Um, but you could imagine doing quite a lot of different, uh, using quite a lot of different approaches here. So you could Think of it running sort of a coarse scale global model at the same time as your limited area model and coupling these in different ways. Um, or you could try use this kind of forcing approach where you have forcing from the global forecast to the limited area model, but how you sort of integrate that forcing from the global forecast uh, is also an interesting question. There's many ways one could imagine doing this with the machine learning models. And then, as has been mentioned earlier, uh, the probabilistic modeling and doing ensemble forecasting. We're really seeing, so I mean, this is really becoming the next big step also for the global models. Um, and I think also for the limited area models, this will be a, a huge question. And I, I have to agree that I, I believe that this year will probably be the year of uh, probabilistic uh, neural weather forecasting. And we'll see, we're, I mean, already starting to see some great advancements in this area. So it will be fun to think of how we can also bring these to uh, limited area models. Right, and then I included a slide here, a little bit about kind of when I think of these models, what their implications could be to wind power and uh, I guess uh, power systems in a more wider sense. And I, I label this speculation here because I'm of course no expert in wind power, but uh, I still wanted to take the freedom to speculate a bit. Um, and things that I think would be really interesting to uh, see and hear more about. So one thing is that the, the limited area models that we have been working with uh, and that they, they sort of, they have a quite, they're still on a country level scale, right? It's still a quite large area, um, but there's not much that would prevent you from really zooming in to a very specific local area. Uh, so maybe not a wind power site, or uh, that's one option, I guess, but it may be uh, a specific area where you are really interested in how the uh, wind or solar, for example, uh, to forecast that um, and to try to sort of uh, utilize these methods there. And then connecting back to the probabilistic modeling aspect, the modeling of the uncertainty, I think seems like it would be a very crucial part uh, also for these kinds of applications. So kind of being able to somewhat answer queries like, okay, what's the probability that the wind speed will exceed some threshold at this time, given that these are our estimates for initial conditions uh, should be really useful for all kinds of things like pricing or scheduling maintenance and uh, so on. Of course, the data is a challenge, uh, as is often the case with machine learning. So, um, I mean, you need in some way sort of dense fields of training data to build, learn these kinds of models. Uh, so, and that's some kind of at the resolution that you are interested in doing the modeling. Um, but I also think there's really interesting sort of opportunities when it comes to the data, maybe in combining weather and power generation data in different ways uh, and the models for these different tasks. So, I mean, I know that if you think of machine learning models for forecasting power generation, there's already use of uh, the weather forecasts as sort of input features in those models. But now if the machine learning model is itself, uh, or if the weather forecasting model is itself a machine learning model, you could imagine coupling these different models uh, 
even more uh, and in sort of new constellations. So I think that's uh, another uh, exciting area in the future. So that's been a little bit about neural weather prediction for limited area modeling. I have the, added the links here to the, our paper and to the code on GitHub. Now I look forward to some interesting questions and you can also feel free to contact me later if you want to ask more about these things. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Very nice presentation. Uh, let's see what questions. Um, so the one of the the first question is, uh, is have you tried including some topographical information as input? Uh, yes, that is an input uh, to the model, uh, the orography uh, of this area. Um, I think there's also different ways on how to include that, um, but uh, it is included as an input uh, sort of at every time step, one could say, in this case. I think there are cases where we feel that the model is losing that too much. Uh, so that is an sort of interesting uh, thing to explore further also, that it could use make better use of that information in uh, its prediction. So how about land use pattern? Means uh, just the topography or you have land use pattern is also there, soil moisture, the static fields are included already? Uh, no, not land use specifically. It's uh, um, I I don't know all of the details on how it's uh, the sort of uh, defined, but it's a uh, quite coarse uh, just orography of the ground. So there's nothing telling you if it's a city, for example, or if uh, it's uh, farmland. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next question. Um, how do you think we could include the uncertainty in such weather prediction models? Yeah, it's a big question, right? Uh, I mean, I have my ideas and I think that's what uh, everyone is uh, working with. Um, I, I think the points that uh, Mariana laid out are quite a good summary there with uh, uh, the deep generative models uh, uncertainty from the initial conditions and different types of perturbations. Um, I definitely think, and I mean, we're seeing this with, for example, Gencast using uh, diffusion models that uh, there's inspiration to be drawn from a lot of the generative modeling uh, literature in the machine learning area. Okay. Um... There is one question. Uh, can you elaborate on the reason that the the high lamp mesh did not introduce mesh artifacts like the GC mesh did? Uh, some explanation. Yes, let me bring up the slide. Uh, so, so the thing that the way we view this uh, is that. The problem, or the, the, the artifacts in the for the GCLAM model, they tend to appear around nodes in the mesh graph that have a lot of neighbors that have a lot have a lot of incoming edges to them. Um, so when you have this kind of multi-scale mesh graph, some of the nodes will have just a few neighbors, and then some will have quite a lot because they have these long-range edges in there. Um, so there's sort of a, kind of a shift. It's not really uniform over the area. Uh, and this is where we see the artifacts appear. If we have the uh, high lamb model instead, you can think of the bottom layer here. It's sort of uniform in its structure all over the area. All these nodes have the same number of neighbors. Uh, so we're here sort of, we have a uniform uh, set of nodes that connect to the grid. Um, but we still have these longer edges. It's just that we find them higher up in the architecture. So in some way, we're trying to get best of both worlds here. We want uniform structure, but we still want to keep these long edges because we see, in particular, if we compare sort of the 1L LAM and the GC LAM model, uh, numerically, we see that these longer connections really do help. And uh, this is also what uh, earlier literature has found. Interesting. 
Um, you mentioned a couple of times ground truth in your graphics. Um, can you elaborate what it is exactly? Is it um, a, another NWP forecast, basically the MAPS forecast or MAPS analysis field? What is it? Mm. Yeah, yeah. so uh, that's a good question. Maybe I should elaborate more on. So, so in this case, it is one MAPS forecast. Uh, so we have not worked with any uh, analysis data here. Uh, so it's sort of you, you're starting the MAPS or the MAPS forecast, you're using the same initial condition to start your uh, machine learning model. And then you're comparing the machine learning model, how closely it sticks to the MAPS forecast. So the, it's that forecast that I refer to as the ground truth, and that's shown in the plots. OK. Uh, I think this question was asked previously for other speakers, but it's important. Is it possible to include as input uh, additional measurements from distributed MET station in the forecast area? Yeah, I mean, I think this is uh, uh, something that we want to keep do more in the future, and that uh, a motivation maybe for this kind of uh, graph-based uh, models to. Uh, be able to sort of plug in those kinds of things. Uh, so I, I definitely think that will be a possibility and that could be uh, really useful to uh, improving these models. Um, it's not something we're doing right now, but uh, it's definitely something uh, we want to explore and I think many people will explore in the future. Yeah. Um, could, you, uh, could local mesh refinement of the global AI models also be a viable approach to couple the LAM models? I guess uh, people are asking that if you can use the boundary conditions from these global AI models to the your LAM model. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, so, so I guess that would be the kind of uh, what I kind of mean in having a course or running a course or global model and then uh, more fine-grained uh, limited area models sort of jointly that you could then connect these kinds of meshes uh, to each other. That is definitely one uh, very viable approach, I think. Um, there's a lot of details sort of on how to do that in practice, uh, but I think the sort of general idea of doing that is definitely one of the main directions uh, to go in in exploring uh, this coupling between global and uh, limited area models. Yeah, uh, there are a few more questions, but I think uh, in the interest of time, let's go with one more. Um, the Do the boundary conditions taken from the input analysis change over time since the target is a snippet of the input analysis? Uh, so let's see. Yeah, yes, so the, the boundary here uh, is always from a different uh, time step. Uh, so that changes with uh, time. Uh, it's the short answer, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we should move on. Thank you, Joel, again. It's a, I learned a lot. And um, so now move on to the last speaker. And uh, our last speaker is... Uh, Florian um, Ackerman, he's representing ETH and Zua AI, and he's going to talk about ultra high resolution wind forecasts. Move closer to the microphone or? Uh, well, is, it, is it now better? A little bit, yes. Yes. Okay, I'll try to move closer to the microphone. Or... Okay. Thank uh, you. So um, let me first introduce you my background a bit because I'm actually coming from robotics or the lab I'm working with, we are working with autonomous drones and more specifically with these autonomous flying drones. So why do we care about the weather? And there, I mean, we, we've done some of very long distance missions um, within the, some projects in our lab, for example, one here where we flew over uh, in Greenland with an autonomous drone to a glacier covering over 200 kilometers while flying there, taking images and going back. And another flight that we did was here in Switzerland, where we flew a bit a shorter distance, 70 kilometers, um, over the lake of Neuchatel. 
And during these missions, the drone uh, had to do all these operations autonomously and uh, making sure that it keeps track uh, of the paths that it pre planned in these cases here. Um, during this flight, you also had some issues that you experienced. For example, here, Atlantic Tower, the plane, should have just flown straight ahead, uh, keeping level attitude. But as you can see, it really struggles flying straight ahead due to strong winds that were uh, caused by the rigging team here in the background. Uh, during another flight uh, or time during the same flight, uh, we can see here the tracked altitude and the actual altitude that it should track, which should be constant. And we can see that it deviates quite a bit up to 50 meters from this pre-planned flight altitude uh, due to very strong up and down drafts that were exceeding the aircraft's limitations. So namely the climb limit, how much how fast can it climb or how fast can it sink? And during these large scale missions, we obviously considered the weather forecast. However, due to the, let's say rather low resolution for our application, it didn't consider the train at enough high resolution causing the local winds to deviate quite significantly, significantly um, resulting in these offsets that we are in this flight of the Silicon Sea. So therefore, for our scope, we had the goal of predicting the wind on board the UAV because we were flying in this very remote area. So we couldn't rely on, let's say, regular communication um, to any ground station. And this in turn would us enable us to fly safer and more efficient flight paths for these type of long uh, scale uh, duration missions. Um, if we come up with a wish list, what we would like as a wind prediction or what wind predictions we would like, um, we ideally want to have a spatial resolution less than 100 meters because then we also include actual terrain features at that scale. The domain size should be about 27 kilometers or as large as possible, such that we cover really the area to where we fly. We would like to have uh, predictions within five, five minute steps and multiple hours, therefore spanning our um our flights when we looked at these and when we talked to shua as well we realized that these would be very interesting also for the renewable energy market having such forecasts and that's why we have this project now in collaboration with shua who is currently working with a global ai weather modeling or developing one um we then were very much aware that these were very high hanging fruits so we first started with a proof of concept where we wanted to predict the steady state flow around complex terrain um, in with a domain size of 1.1 kilometer. There, the reasoning was that we wanted to use the Cosmo 1 data as initial, initialization for our model, which has a 1.1 kilometer grid. And we set for a spatial resolution of 17 meters uh, because we used the 64 cube grid to predict the weather. Um, we already have methods that can predict the wind at such high resolutions. If you given an elevation map, some wind information, such as boundary conditions, you can compute the steady state flow around these terrains uh, with, for example, a RAND CFT simulation, and then we get a dense wind field. However, these require run on a computer, on a desktop grade computer, run times between one to eight hours, which is way too much for our onboard compute uh, systems that we have available on the small drones. And as well, uh, once you're flying, we can't really accurately set these boundary conditions anymore, or there would be an optimization required to set the boundary conditions that actually match the meteorological situation that we have uh, encountered out there. So that is why we opted for a neural network replacing the CFP simulation, but still used this CFP simulation to uh, generate training data to train such a neural network. Uh, we generated a wind flow data set. Uh, we used uh, a bit more than 500 train patches, real train patches from Switzerland at one meter resolution to set the train for the CFT simulation. We simulated different wind directions and wind speeds over these train patches. And in the end, we have about 7,300 simulated CFT flows. It took us about 9,000 CPU hours to compute. How did we then set up our model? What information does the model get to do these predictions? Um, we had a few iterations, and the final one was that we input the train information as a distance field to the model. We have uh, some set of sparse measurements that we 
during training randomly sample, which should emulate the motion of a UAV, so straight lines or circles. And we give it the measurement of these few uh, measurements and as well as a measurement mask. So indicating which cells of the regular grid input contain a measurement and which ones don't. Then it is tasked to predict on the same grid as it gets for the input, uh, the output wind. So it outputs a dense 3D wind map uh, with all three uh, velocities and as well the turbulent kinetic energy as computed by the CFT simulation. We tested this approach on CFT data that was held back during training and it worked quite well there, but obviously we were also interested in how well does it work with real wind data. And luckily there we could get hand on data from three measurement campaigns. One was the Boland Hill, uh, the other one the Ascovane Hill in Scotland, and the final one the um, Perdigao Hill in uh, Portugal. And how we used our model there was we gave it the topography information and we used the measurement from only one mast to uh, give that as an input to the model. And then we let it predict the uh, prediction or the, let it predict the wind over the full domain. And then we could query or compare the predicted values with the measured values at the other marsh locations. As you can notice here, uh, one interesting property that our network learned was that we have in these three test cases, we had quite different length scales, which really led us to having a different definition for each one of these cases. So meaning that the resolution between the cases changes quite significantly from about one meter in the um, Boland case up to eight meters in the Perdigal case. So all of these resolutions were higher than observed during training. And we did not never train the network with such high resolution. And interestingly enough, it could generalize also to these different resolutions. And we think that this is due to having the Terrain information available as a distance field, which gave the network a sense of scale. And therefore, if it knew that, or if it can see from the distance field that there's a high resolution, so it can generalize to these cases as well. If we then compare all the predictions from all different masks and all different cases, and we can compute the average error and the correlation over all these cases. And we compare it to a baseline that assumes just that the wind is constant, which at least for UAVs, at this scale was most commonly done at the moment. If you look at the magnitude error, we can see that it decreases a bit, uh, but the correlation of the predicted values is pretty high. If we then look at the other channels, for example, the vertical wind and the turbulent kinetic energy, we can see that the difference between the network model and the turbulent kinetic energy is much more significant. And this is also due to the effect that the neural uh, that in these two channels, the measurements also vary much more than for the wind magnitude. Um, it would be also interesting to see how well does a more competitive baseline do than just assuming averaging. And luckily for the Boland Hill, for one direction, there was a blind study uh, executed. And there we have results from other CFD models, how they model the wind or how accurate accurately can they model the wind around this, this hill specifically. And there the metric used was the speed up error, which is the error on the estimated speed up, which is just the measurement at a certain uh, mast and a certain height, normalized by the measurement at the corresponding mast far away from the hill. And there our model uh, resulted in a speed up error of a bit more than 20%. And averaging scores at 33%. And if you look at the best performing CFT model that had runtimes in the order of hours, the error is at 15%. And if we limit our comparison to CFT models that potentially could run on board, uh, meaning runtimes less than 15 minutes, we can see that our network model, uh, outperforms all these CFT models quite significantly. And in fact, these CFT models are closer to the averaging baseline than to our uh, neural network model. If we look at uh, one qualitative example, because in these um, cases, the measurements were usually, uh, or the towers were arranged along lines. If you look at the prediction along one of these lines, 
um, we can see uh, compare the network prediction to these uh, to the measurements obtained. And here we can see three neural network predictions. Why three? Because we in this case we used three different measurements or towers as input. So one really at the hilltop, and two in between the two hills, so on the lee side of the hill. And what you can see that for one prediction, it works quite well for the horizontal wind velocities and as well for the vertical velocity. Whereas for other networks, it seems a bit worse. So what we concluded or what we saw is that not all measurements were equally informative or the network could not handle all measurements equally well. So especially measurements from the lee side of the hill yielded a much worse prediction, usually under predicting the wind magnitudes. But nevertheless, we're quite happy to see that especially the vertical velocities, meaning updrafts and downdrafts were quite well um, represented. And also please note that this is one of the most complex cases. So in the simple cases such as Oscar Wayne, where we have a single hill, the network predictions were much more convincing than in this one here. So overall, um, for this initial proof of concept, we could we did um, conclude that high resolution wind now costing is feasible with a CNN as a surrogate model of a high fidelity CFT model. The inference time is very, very quick, even on flat grade hardware, the inference time is less than a second, and we can have mid resolution. Obviously, there are quite a few limitations to this work. So first of all is that the high fidelity model is still quite simplified. So we only have steady state flow, uniform temperature, for example, and much more. Because it's steady state, the current model doesn't have any forecasting capability. And since it's, uh, as you can see here on the left side, we also deal with a somewhat unbalanced data set. So usually we had a very small portion of the region that was uh, on the lee side of the hill. And therefore the network did not see that much probably contributing to the fact that it did not perform quite well if it got measurements from this side. And so this goes into the last part that the current network did not fully learn how to encode the measurement position uh, sufficiently. And these were problems that we tried to solve in this collaboration now with Shua, where we try to move on from the proof of concept that was steady state flow to a model that has a bit lower resolution, but still close to 100 meters that we desire. We wanted to have a larger domain as well. And now we aim towards predicting the wind at five meter time steps in the horizon of maybe an hour or multiple hours, but not days. Uh, that would be too challenging probably. And how could we achieve this? Or how are we trying to achieve this? Uh, on the left hand side, you can see the proof of concept approach. We still uh, give the high resolution elevation map as an input to the model. Additionally, we want to give it an encoding of the global weather solution by using a low resolution AI model as input. And we want to still also allow to have local measurements, for example, from an UAV or from weather stations as input to the network. And then the network should still try to pre uh, predict the dense wind field around, uh, around this topography. But additionally, some information such as, for example, cloud and precipitation, which could be interesting for UAV flight or solar UAV flight as well. But additionally, also um, for uh, renewable energy forecasting. And instead of using the simplified CFT simulation, in this work, we use the WF or ARW model to generate training data for the model. How do we, we set up the, the WRF pipeline to generate the data that we need for this model? So we initialize the model with the ERA-5 free analysis data. In the first step, we run the uh, mesoscale run with three domains going from nine to one kilometers down. And there we actually use a planetary boundary layer model. Then we process the output with the up model uh, up uh, um, application such that it's suitable again for another WRF run, which is then an LES run where we don't have any planetary boundary layer models and the edits are resolved within the model themselves. And there we have two domains going from 333 meters to 111 meters. And then we post-process post -process the output and um, computing the mean over these five minutes 
and as I said, we can also save data or storage space in the end. Um, we set up the model in the following configuration. Um, for both runs, we have the WSM6 uh, microphysics scheme. I've used the YSU scheme for the mesoscale run and the 3D Smagorinsky closure for the LES run. The uh, radiation is modeled with the RTGM, the RTMG model. And for the land surface, we use NOAA MP. We did run some benchmarking if that configuration, especially the mesoscale one, is correct. And there we run um, just uh, for five locations, uh, eight days of simulation spread over uh, different times of the year. And these locations were also spread over um, the world. And we compare it to the one hour sign up data uh, that I uh, was made available to me. And we tested three different configurations, um, two different bound planetary boundary layer model, uh, schemes and two microphysics schemes. And as you can see, the performance averaged over all different locations, all different times is pretty similar. And related work also did not really conclude with one configuration that works best for all cases. So depending on the location and time, different schemes were recommended. And this is also consistent with these experiments. So for a given time and for a given um, location, there was one composition that was outperforming the other ones uh, significantly. However, averaged over all cases, they were pretty consistent. And that's why we switched, just chose the best one to go forward with this work. Um, in the post-processing, we compute the five minute averages from the WRF output. We store only a subset of the computed variables, such as the wind, temperature, pressure, cloud fraction, relative humidity, and the mixture ratios. And by doing that, we can reduce the data volume quite a bit. So 24 hours of simulation data raw from WRF is about 900 gigabyte. And if we post-process it in that way, we only have about 35 gigabyte left, meaning it's much more handleable or scalable. And we're currently running uh, the data generation pipeline all the times in parallel. And we have so far about 52 days of simulated day data available um, at four different locations. And about 24 hours of simulation takes about 4,000 CPU hours and three days of wall clock time. And just to show you a sneak peek of what this data looks like. So I have here just the wind magnitude um, at 100 meter resolution uh, here at Sydney. And here you can see that the uh, terrain is not that, let's say, uh, or we don't have so high elevation changes. So it's mostly uh, a smoother flow. And if you look, for example, here at Switzerland, where we have very steep terrain, this is close to Rigi, that is a more than 2000 meter high or 2000 meter high mountain. You can see that the terrain affects much more how low looks like. So this already leads me to the end of the talk. So I've shown or we've shown that high resolution wind prediction in the meter scale is possible with a neural network as a surrogate model of high fidelity uh, models. We have, or we are currently are investigating two different high fidelity models. One, the run CFD, it was quite efficient, so we could generate quite a few, lot of data very quickly. But the limitation was that it was only steady state and quite simplified. However, we could show that the neural network could still predict these flow patterns. For the WRF, WRF LES model, it has the high or large advantage that it can or it predicts the temporal flow or it computes it. But on the downside, it's computationally quite expensive. And on steep terrain, it can diverge, which was in contrast to the run CFD that did not diverge. So we have to do some terrain smoothing such that we can compute these high resolution flows. And it still has to be remain to be seen whether neural networks can predict this more complex flows that are produced by this uh, simulation. Obviously, there are also some general limitations to that approach, and uh, which still might validate why we need to do some work on the physical model. So since we use uh, our neural network as a surrogate model, we still can improve our overall models. If we can produce more accurately high resolution data, then we also our neural networks will benefit from it because they get better training data per se. And then currently one limitation for the WRF LES simulation 
is that although we have a grid and the topography is available at this 111 meters, it still relies on some static information that is not available at such a high global resolution everywhere. So therefore, also our simulation might contain some artifacts or some small errors because this uh, static information is not available at the native grid resolution. And where are we at now? So we're generating a lot more data at the moment. And we've started training neural networks or uh, experimenting with different architectures on this new data set. Uh, currently we're uh, limiting it to one location to see, to get a very uh, quick throughput on it. We're testing different architectures, transformers, graph neural networks, or even generative models. And we're also looking towards if we should have a single model that takes in all the inputs, or if we should have more as related work, uh, having encoded for all these different input modalities, then a network that fuses all this information together, and then having a network that is specialized in only forecasting one encoding of the wind to another encoding of the wind. Um, then one thing which would be also interesting to see, which goes towards the last point, um, then also which is, does the input contain enough information to predict the flow. So in the previous work, we showed that just if the train and very few measurements, it was enough to uh, encode and predict the full flow state. However, with these dependent or this time dependent model, time varying models, we might need either specialized local models, which are really only trained for one location, or um, uh, maybe we need more input information such that you can initialize or we have enough information for the model to uniquely uh, identify the flow state such that it can really accurately predict also the flow overall. Um, yeah, with that, I'm already at the end of the presentation and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Florian. <clears throat> nice presentation. So let's see if we have questions. Um, Okay, there are a couple of questions. So the first one, I think, um, how long were the output wind speed time series and what was the spatial and time resolution? Um, so I assume you mean that's for the WRF simulation. So currently I'm running a simulation for two days, so 48 hours. And the WRF, I mean the time step within the WRF model um, is set to 1.2 seconds for the LES run for the uh, outermost domain and for the inner domain it is or for the actual domain that we care it's sub second and we store the these doubler f outputs at every minute and this is kind of a compromise to limit a bit the storage space that it needs uh, on the cluster because there we also have only limited storage space available and with that i could run it for the full time uh, domain and that can also run some runs in parallel. And the 48 hours are mostly limited by the, the runtime limit that we have on our cluster, which is five days. And one simulation takes almost exactly for two days, five days. And that is one of the limitations that we have. I mean, you could run it for a longer time, but we opted for then more simulations at different, let's say, starting times such that you can cover different seasons as well, or also different locations. So that's uh, our thought process behind that. Okay. Uh, next question is, um, Jua sells modeling from a one by one kilometer global model. Mm -hmm. Could this high resolution technique be used for the entire globe as a HR training data? Um, I mean, it could be used. Uh, I mean, what we envision more is that this one kilometer output would be used as input to our to this model here, uh, that we have a better, uh, let's say, idea of the global weather scale or that we have more in, uh, input information available. Um, I mean, the one kilometer is maybe, I can, let's to go to uh, one of the slides here. Let's see. I can quickly find it. Um, so we actually compared how accurate these one kilometer resolutions are. I mean, unfortunately at that time we didn't have the Jua model available. So I expect it to be a bit better, but we had the one kilometer Cosmo data available. So we flew 
at a location which was more or less flat, but there were high mountains in the surrounding um, within two or three kilometers. And these were the corresponding Cosmo profiles that we got, so with wind speeds and magnitude. And when we flew with our drone, we flew just at this corner location up and down, we measured this wind. So um, we, as, we, as you can see, kind of the shape of the wind magnitude is different. And also the orientation is quite off. So we, I think for training really a high fidelity or high resolution model, it is really crucial to have also a physical model or some process that really computes it at that resolution because otherwise uh, features that from the terrains which are at that scale quite important might influence the wind um, that you that you will miss if you use some let's say label training data that has a uh, too low resolution okay um, there are no more questions on Slido, but I have a few questions actually. Mm -hmm. um, so um, probably I missed it, but when you were doing your proof of concept study for, uh, let's say, Boland, Ascarvin, and Pardigal, mm -hmm. um, what were your input features? How do you account for stability effects? Did you have, like you mentioned that you have wind and possibly TKE as your input? Or um, maybe so miss that was... part? Uh, let's see. So it was only wind measurements as an input. Right. Oh yeah. So the input, I mean, the network has in general four channels as input. One contains the terrain as a distance field. That's just what we got from an elevation map and we converted to a distance field and then that channel was given. And then the only other input the network got was the um, measurements from one tower. So, for example, if we take, uh, uh, so for example, if we say here this is the TSC 13 tower, we only give the network the measurement from this tower, which were maybe five to 10, depending on how many were available at the time. Um, and then we let the network predict the wind based on that. So, there were no additional inputs such as stability um, or anything else. So. Also so not the, how, how many levels, for example, vertical levels, do you give as a gradient or as the real values at different the levels? The real values. So just these were the real measured values. And it depends. So at least the Perdigal um, experiment, it had towers ranging from, I think, 5 to 10 levels because they were up to 100 meters high. But there were also other towers that were only three levels because they were about 10 meters high. So it could get anything from, I think, two up to maybe 10 input values over the whole grid domain. Yeah. Okay. It might improve, means naively, I would guess in any, I have been doing LES and this work, this type of mm -hmm. work for 25 yeah. years. I have not done uh, with the neural network, but in general, accounting for stability directly would help in your mm -hmm. flow prediction. So might be another additional channel if you have temperature data to um, levels that might help. Yes, obviously. So this is, uh, I mean, that goes towards the last point in my conclusion. I think with this simplified, where we didn't have an LES simulation. So there it was a steady state RAM simulation as a, as a high, uh, high fidelity model. So there, only inputting the wind speeds was sufficient, but I don't expect that to be the case for the more complicated temporal LES variation. And that's also why we aim to include in this one kilometer GUA model or any, let's say, as high as possible resolution global weather model, because then the network gets an input sense of stability, so temperature. It might also include other or whatever output these Fidelity models uh, will compute as input, which makes it easier to identify kind of the state of the flow or identify the unique solution to the flow. Um, I will have one more question and then I'll double check if there are questions on the slide or just before I ask. Uh, oh, there is one more question. So let, uh, let's answer this one. What do you mean by converting elevation to a distance field? Uh, so this is just, uh, I mean, the network we did here was 
uh, operating on a volumetric grid. So it was a regular, uh, a bit back. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you can think of it, it's kind of this block in space that is, uh, or a cube in space that has one kilometer um, edge or it's one kilometer wide in each dimension. And we just uh, divide it into uh, each dimension into 64 cells. And then the input also is a volumetric input to the network because what the network that you used is a convolutional neural network. So it's quite simple. And uh, the rep or our representation of the train was just we compute for each cell in that 64 cube grid what is the nearest distance to the terrain. So every cell had a kind of a sense of how far am I away from the distance. So this also helps to propagate the terrain information throughout the whole uh, network domain. Okay. So my, my last question, um, so I was a bit surprised by your choice of uh, Smagorinsky model for mm -hmm. your LES uh, simulation in the WARF LES. Mm -hmm. And because we talked about in earlier presentation that how uncertainty information is very important and like WARF LES has Smagorinsky, Deardorff, TKE, and then nonlinear backscatter models. So several of those. And uh, among them, I would say the Smagorinsky is probably the weakest. Mm -hmm. And but if you had any other ones, your flow patterns would be very different. Like Smagorinsky will have a lot of dissipation. It will be very smooth field. So was there any decision in terms of running multiple LES models or how would you account? Because LES doesn't mean that it's the truth. It's you get one version of the truth. And if you vary the LES model, you will get a very different uh, result. And also you're not actually doing LES because you have a 300 meter resolution, which is quite large grid spacing and uh, 300 and 100. And these are kind of what we would call the, the kind of the borderline of what we can call a larger dissimulation. It's more like a gray, gray zone modeling that you are doing. So is there any plan for improving on the LES? Because there are some private codes for even in war, for example, to have a dynamic uh, uh, LES models, subgrid scale models. Okay. Would you be interested in using those? Because NCAR has those, for example. I mean, our, I mean the design process uh, to choosing the model configuration was mostly done. I talked to people who are actually running the WARF model. And also some other group at ETH um, who were running it over Swiss Alps. And this was the complication that told me kind of this should work the best. Um, obviously, I mean, apparently, I mean, there are better ones. And I think any improvement to the warp simulation will then also benefit in the end the, our approach. So I would be quite interested in pursuing that. Um, I think. It would be for sure, let's say, on the long run, be interesting to see or to run, let's say, generate data with different uh, turbulence closures and therefore also give the model kind of an idea of how different solutions can look like. Because I think in the end, we're in that scale, it's also maybe a bit more towards probabilistic. So it would be interesting to pick up maybe the idea that Joel had of we just say a probability of the wind speed, for example, achieving a certain. Uh, value that might be maybe more realistic but i think for this work here at least for the short term we opted for this one model because we first want to investigate again can the neural network even predict these flow patterns and before we can answer this one question i think we shouldn't go too many steps ahead because there might be too many things where it can fail on the way so taking one step so going from this steady state solution to somewhat LES or gray box uh, or, assist or grayscale uh, systems might be a first step. And once you can see that, we can add another layer on top where we increase the complexity, where we say, okay, so we are not sure if this closure is the exact or the best one. So we might use a different one. And then we have also more variety in the input data and we can have maybe a probabilistic output. Yeah, sounds like a good plan. Well, thanks again, Florian, and thanks to all the speakers. And uh, so I think uh, we are going to have a um, uh, the break or no break. There is an open discussion and closing uh, remarks. So, uh, Gregor, are we taking a short break or we are continuing?
Now we only have 10 minutes left, so we, we just go to some closing closing discussion. Okay. And I think Joanna prepared uh, some questions for the closing remarks. That's right. I've just launched the uh, the last question. So the question is, are you currently using uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning technologies? And so far about 80% of people, 70% have replied yes. So definitely bending towards the yes. And uh, previously we had um, um, a question um, of how would you rank the challenges and opportunities in this field? I suppose maybe we could just do a, a quick a quick summary before uh, we move on with the discussions. I think we actually covered quite a lot of ground today. We've looked at the current landscape in data-driven weather forecasting, as well as some uh, deep learning modeling. Um, there's definitely been uh, a lot of advances in the last couple of years, um, but um, there are also the, some of the limitations that have been highlighted. I think uh, Mariana has uh, summarized these uh, very nicely. So, for example, we're not able to capitalize on, on the speed uh, with fewer computational resources. Um, this has opened as well huge opportunities for data simulation as well as higher resolution, as uh, Flori has, has just um, talked about. Um, and uh, we, we've now really excitingly seeing a move from uh, um, applying AI technologies for global modeling to um, local um, local area um, um, domains. Um, so uh, Joel covered this in his presentation. So that's that's really exciting news. Um, of course, there are some caveats. Um, um, uh, there are things that um, uh, around uh, the uh, the quality of the training data um, that uh, st still need to be addressed, and the kind of uh, how how we can manage the complexity of in the variety of of, of input data to train these models. Um, nevertheless, um, again, great potential for um, to to improve the prediction of extreme events. Um, and also Gregory uh, showed um, how we can uh, apply um, uh, or he showed at the testing of Pangu weather for uh, storm tracking. So uh, there's a lot going on and I'm sure we'll see um, and many more news over the coming months. Um, I think the kind of it'll be interesting to see how uh, things are going to evolve as people seem to um to converge in the idea that the next big step is probabilistic forecasting um so um so it, it, it's really uh let's see how that's going to to pan out over the next few months um but i guess there's still quite a few open questions particularly involving um, um multiple communities and uh, so how how can we um enable uh, the conversation between uh, different sectors um, and um, um, create opportunities for more multidisciplinary projects and platforms. Um, how will the research direction evolve? Um, and um, what are the, kind of the, the main constraints, particularly around um, and opportunities around um, uh, open data and, and, and open code? Um, so, yeah. I think that's kind of a, a summary. Um, I don't know if yeah, anyone I think would like to add. It, you've covered it all. And I really liked your one uh, phrase that in the next couple of months, what we are going to 
do. So we used to say next couple of years. Yes. And now in this particular field, that's uh, impressive. Means nobody can predict what's going to come up next. Uh, I just want to point out something was sur was surprising to me, not from just today's uh, presentation. Uh, just last week, one of my colleagues uh, at Albany, he uh, forwarded me a post from uh, NOAA's weather prediction and discussion. They are paying attention to the AI-based model forecast that have been uh, posted on this uh, ECMWF charts. And they were discussing where Pangu weather is, for example, was predicting a blizzard condition for New York versus something more milder condition for the physics-based model. Sadly, I was not here, so I don't really know uh, whether we who got it right. But the point uh, I want to make is that just within a year of these models came to um, kind of being alive that, that people are already using it as high level as in the operational forecast community. So I think uh, by the end of this year, we might see a huge amount of progress, but I think the game changer would be for me personally would be the mesoscale modeling because that if we can really make breakthrough like what Joel has already shown an incredible amount of work on also Florian in the micro scale. So it would be really, really an interesting uh, avenue of research. Yeah, thank you, Shikanta. Another thing that I wanted to share are the, uh, the results from the rank pool question. So on the top, we have cost reduction as one of the, the main opportunities that uh, AI-based modeling will bring, um, uh, followed by uh, the availability of timely forecasts, um, as well as uh, be better quality data. Um, I suppose um, we we could have a separate conversation about what quali better quality data means. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, thank you for thank you for um, participating in in the polls. Are there any other questions to the speakers? Or generic questions as well. And at this point, you can unmute and directly say. Coach? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> hello. I would like to congratulate for the organization and the excellent presentations. Um, if we, uh, I have a more general question, if we take example of the other areas where, uh, um, you know, the the uh, artificial intelligence has been applied and um, we have seen results which are, uh, I mean, uh, more advanced, let's say, than the area of weather forecasting. Um, uh, now, uh, okay, we, we had technical achievements like the ones you mentioned that you want to achieve in the next year or the next two years, probabilistic forecasting. But when we go to the next level, we speak about uh, requirements for the AI models, and uh, no, notably, this sometimes this summarized to we request models a, an AI which is trustworthy, and this reflects some properties like uh, uh, resilience, reliability, um, uh, interpretability, etc. Uh, in your work, have you thought about the properties that we would like from the AI models? Because so far. We have not asked the questions by the physical models because physical models are, uh, we master them, they are interpretable, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, for, for me, this is really the uh, next uh, generation of questions that go beyond the technical questions that we can have now about the data simulation or other, other of probabilistic forecasting, et cetera. I mean, you can, you can resolve these problems and then the end users we use uh, weather forecast for critical uh, uh, operations, etc. They can say, ah, but we cannot use because uh, the, the AI models are not uh, uh, easy to trust or are not, uh, uh, le let's say, interpretable or, uh, you know, uh, it's all what we see today that end users request from AI uh, models. George, so, maybe I can, um, I will not answer the question, but I will uh, counteract by saying that I think we are demanding too much from the AI models. And as you, at the beginning, you said that we do master the physics models, but let's ask honestly, 
we saw the uh, presentation of Florian, let's say the we have WARF model, it has 12 different planetary boundary layer schemes. It has 25 microphysics schemes. So the question is each one of them leads to a different answer. So we actually know what we are putting in there, but that doesn't mean it's correct. That doesn't mean it's reliable. It can give to a completely different answer and completely wrong answer for a given situation. For example, there used to be a period for about four years that WARF model, the default scheme, the Yonsei University scheme was actually not using any stability function. It's a coding error. Community was using that blindly and was actually simulating neutral conditions. So the, the point I'm making that physics-based models are so complicated, it has so many parameterizations and so on. They are not necessarily the, the, the truth, okay? We understand physics better and we the, you, I have been doing in that particular field for long enough. And what I'm saying is, AI-based model doesn't mean that based because they are based on data, they may not be the trustworthy. And so that's my two cents, but I would let others chime in there. That's that's actually a very good point, Shikanta. Just very quickly, I think one of the one of the key uh, factors that might actually contribute to um, improving the explainability is how we will progress in the area of probabilistic forecasting in artificial intelligence. Um, will this actually enable us to better quantify uncertainty? Um, and will, but of course, that's not just, that's not the end of the line. Then we need to communicate things better. There's the interpretability issue as well. Uh, so obviously there's, you know, again, communication needs to be improved between the scientists and the users. Um, yeah, anyway, not, I don't know if anyone wants to add anything else. Ariana, you seem to have an opinion. Oh, uh, yeah, I know I switched on my camera, but I think um, you both answered, basically said what I wanted to say. So, um, yeah, I, I think I think the question of interpretability, it's something that I find really interesting uh, and all these explained where our techniques, the problem especially, and I think they need time to develop. Um, and yeah, but I totally agree with, with what you both said. Um, yeah, and, uh, and that's why I like working in the uncertainty field as well, because I think that that can help a lot. And maybe I can add a little bit, just when we look at uh, classical CFD field, we have some kind of truth because you have, let's say a classical problem, backward facing step, and you know what would be the, let's say the turbulent kinetic energy field should look like, or you have a, a lead driven, the, the cavity flow. And these are classical solutions we have results to. As we move more and more complex, uh, the features, for example, flow over complex terrain, we are still relying on a few field campaigns. So the, for example, Boland, Askarvin, and uh, the Pardigao, the recent ones, but, to generalize, we do still do not have very good theory. The DTU is still using WASP model, which is uh, essentially using um, Jackson Hunt approach. So with these, when you try to do some theoretical development, you really make either things too simple or you go brute force with very complicated models and the models are highly dependent on parameterization. So in the physics space. So, my feel is that now we are looking at things with a completely different optics with complete data-based approach and we should probably can have more trust on the data. And again, people will complain sensors can be wrong and you have lots of issues with the data, but maybe that would be a complementary to what's our physics-based. We are not trying to say that the, the physics-based are the truth and we are trying to create surrogate of the physics, but rather my philosophy, I think what we are trying to do, physics-based is one way of solving this problem. We are looking at a complementary approach, which m probably is more efficient as, uh, and but only the next few months will tell. Again, no more years ahead. Okay, thank you. I could not. I not uh, want really to move the discussion to the area of uh, physical models and their value, etc. But uh, 
to the what we observe today uh, that when artificial intelligence is used uh, in an industrial concept, uh, context, then uh, the actors request some properties from the uh, artificial intelligence models, which are somehow summarized by what we say, some, most of them, but what, by what we say, trustworth uh, uh, AI. Uh, and this includes some properties like uh, resilience, uh, reliability, interpretability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, my question was if uh, these properties are somehow integrated, or the, the, these requirements are integrated in the ongoing research to develop uh, AI, efficient AI models that potentially are uh, used uh, or usable by industrials, uh, following these properties actually. But uh, I think the the question, the answers were uh, quite clarifying, and I thank you. I, I think George, the same. If you ask those properties for our current generation weather prediction models, I think they will fail as well. So that's what I'm saying. That uh, maybe again, this is personal opinion. So again, maybe there is a different way to look at the problem, but I think those bars that you are talking about, trustworthiness and so on, and that's usually in the natural language processing related problems or even computer vision problems that people are using. I don't know whether it's useful in our field. It, 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 I, I take it back. I think it's useful, but I don't think that our baseline with physics-based models, we are there yet. So again, maybe for the... Uh, having a same set of bars for both types of model would be necessary. Interesting. Thank you. Any other question, comments? There was one, one in the chat now, um, which says, uh, thanks for the great event. Um, any suggestions from the speakers for educators um, and students or early career researchers? Are there any courses? I, I read that as, um, are there any courses or early career researchers or, or students or educators to tie in? Um, we, we did a, a massive online open course for machine learning and weather and climate uh, at ECMWF last year, which is freely available to everybody. So I can put that in the chat. Um, it's a quite a long course, but because it's free, you can sort of enter where you want. And um, if people are interested in that. Thanks. I guess uh, my advice, I, I can't turn on my camera for some reason, but uh, I guess my advice is to just start playing around with these things. And yes, the, I mean, the lovely thing is that so much of this is uh, open source and have great licenses and so. So uh, sort of try to get your hands dirty with these types of methods and explore. And there's so many interesting questions to explore that uh, if you just start doing a little, I think you can achieve a lot. And there's also a nice sort of community building around these things, I would say. So try to also engage with that. Right. I think Good. I think we've reached out the end of the questions, Grego. Yes, exactly. We also reached the end of the time, which um, yes. is a nice coincidence. Uh, then thank you too. Um, Joanna and Sukanda for actually organizing this workshop and um, finding the speakers and um, discussing with the speakers. Thanks um, very especially also um, to the speakers, of course. Uh, that was brilliant. Um, and this uh, will be on the um, forecasting YouTube, IA Wind Forecasting YouTube channel shortly. I don't know exactly how long it's going to take, a um, few days probably. Uh, and I'll post that link then in the um, in the LinkedIn discussion. And uh, for those of you who are task members, I hope to see you on, in the task meeting on the 22nd or 24th um, January. Uh, 
And if you're interested in minute scale forecasting, um, for example, for um, wind farm control or um, any uh, or very short term trading, um, then we're having a um, in person, mostly in person workshop um, at Riso on the 10th and 11th of April. More mails coming around for that. Thanks all for being here um, and speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.